Right, welcome. I've got an official, because it's the beginning of the day, I've got an official bit I have to read, so um, if you, you would bear with us, that'd be great. Okay. I declare open this hearing of the Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee's inquiry into the Centrelink's compliance program. Um, we acknowledge the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal Ngambri people and the land on which we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. These are public hearings and a Hansard transcript is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the internet. Today the committee will hear evidence from the Australian Taxation Office and the Departments of Human Services, Social Services and Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. I remind everyone that the Senate has resolved that an officer of a department of the Commonwealth or of a state shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when or how policies were adopted. The committee understands that all witnesses appearing today have been provided with information regarding parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses. Additional copies of the information can be obtained from the Secretariat. The committee prefers all evidence to be given in public, although the committee may determine or agree to a request to have evidence heard in private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness shall state the ground on which the objection is taken and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer having regard to the ground on which is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera and such request may be asked at, um, may be made at any other time. Finally, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones or render them silent? Right, that's that bit done. Um, welcome, thank you for coming today. Thank you, Chair. Um, I now welcome representatives from the Australian Taxation Office. Uh, thank you for appearing today. Um, do you, uh, before we begin, can I ask each of you, or both of you, I should say, to give us your name and the capacity in which you appear today? Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. So, Jeremy Hershorn. Second Commissioner, Client Engagement Group. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Jason Lucchese, Assistant Commissioner, Single Touch Payroll. Thank you. Um, do you um, wish to make a short opening statement? Uh, no, Chair. Okay, thank you. We'll get into questions. Um, can I kick off by asking, I do want to go to the Single Touch Payroll very shortly, but first off, I would like to know if you can tell us how many uh, online compliance, and I'm, by saying that I mean all the online compliance uh, programs, whether it be the original OCI, the um, EIC, at, or uh, QP, any of those uh, debts, how many have been uh, garnished uh, via the taxation system? Um, so. Senator, we uh, are not in a position to tell you how, uh, in a sense, the source of debts. I can uh, give you information on how many uh, how many refunds have been garnished. Um, I can't ascribe them to programs. Okay, um, that's interesting because neither can the department. Um, so, if you could tell us in that case how many have, can you give them to us? for the 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 90 financial years? Uh, so, Senator, with me I have uh, the 16, 17 uh, to, and including actually 19, 20 okay. year to date. I don't have 15, 16. Okay, if you could take that one on notice then, that'd be appreciated, 15, thank 15, you. So 15, 16 on notice? Yes, please. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, 16, 17, so we split them up between Centrelink garnishes and child support garnishes. Uh, Centrelink garnishes, uh, could I maybe just give round numbers and then give provide the, like it's the, the detailed numbers. Okay. Uh, so 45,000, approximately 45,000 for about 38 million. So I, I might do all the Centrelink garnishes year by year first. Yep. So Centrelink garnishes, 16, 17, 45,000 for about 38 million. 17, 18 was about 40,000 
for about 32 million. 1819 was 74,000 for about 63 million. And year to date, uh, and of course it's quite seasonal because most things are in the first few months of the year, to 31 October we had about 66,000 for 72 million. That's year to date. So that's year to date, but that you would expect that the vast bulk of the year would be this would be have already half. been would already have happened because uh, tax the due date is thirty first of October, so most people with refunds would okay. be lodging earlier in the year, not later in yes. the year. Yes. Yep. So uh, can uh, do you want to give us a child support as well? Yeah, I was going to ask that. I was just double checking the Centrelink debts. What what is your understanding of what that includes, or what does that include? So that. We, uh, it's just all Centrelink debt. So any that's any a, compliance. Any, any, any anything where so uh, so the process is broadly that um, DHS give us a list of their their clients who have debts, and, and we put a flag on our files when uh, we work out that there's a refund due to that person. We will let DHS know. Yeah. And then they will let us know, in return, uh, whether and how much uh, there might be a garnishee on that refund. Sorry, they give you. Could you say they give you a notice? So, in a sense, they put a. They give us information yes. to put a flag on the file. Flag. Yep. Uh, when a refund is triggered on a client which has a flag, yep. we will let them know what the refund is and how much right. it is, and then they will let us know how much if any, to garnish from that refund. OK, but, but first off, you just get a flag. First so, off, we just get okay. a flag. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if we do the, um, the... Child support. Child support, yep. So in sixteen seventeen, we uh, had about 99,000 for 116 million. In seventeen eighteen, 109,000 for 128 million. In 1819, 107,000 for 124 million. And in 1920, 85,000 for 104 million. Sorry, could you say that one again? Sorry, 85,000 yeah. for 104 million. Okay. Thank you. Can I just go back to the issue around not knowing what the debts are? So you don't know how many of those debts are based on income averaging? No, Senator. Have you so been asked, have you had any correspondence or interaction with the department or with Centrelink about uh, the issue around income averaging and the amount that has been garnished? Uh, not to my knowledge, Senator. So okay. I mean, Could they have a debt. They will tell us how much to garnish. We, okay. We will. Since since the announcement, or I don't know so much of an announcement, but since it be the government suspended the normal the operation of the income averaging process, have you had any conversations with either the minister, your minister, or, or the um, uh, Services Australia minister about? Uh, suspending garnishing of income averaging debts or how how um, to establish the numbers of garnishees or gar the number of people that were garnished in relation to income averaging uh, so not to my knowledge senator and uh, in a sense uh, I, I wouldn't expect expect us to, I mean, if uh, DHS make a decision to garnish or not garnish on a different basis, we would just see, we would expect to just see that in fewer garnishee requests. And have you seen fewer garnishee requests? Um, no. So, so, so unfortunately, the only numbers I've got in front of me are up to 31 October. I, um, okay. I would expect uh, garnishee numbers to drop off just the nature of the seasonality yes. in any event but I'd have to take on notice any subsequent, what the trends are this year compared to other years. So you had, you've already had for year to date 85,000, and that's between so that's July and 
Oh, uh, sorry, in, in terms of Centrelink, we've had 66,000. 66, yes. Are you able to take um, on notice to give us the, then the the year, the way it flows, uh, the numbers for each of those years, month by month, so we can get an idea about the way that. Obviously, take yes. it on notice. Yes, so Senator, I'm happy to take on notice okay. whether we can provide monthly data or, or even possibly. Uh, Maybe to 31 October and then remainder of year, or would you look? I'll what take I'm, on notice what we can provide. I'm trying to look at how over the financial years it's gone yeah, seasonally. The seasonality, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Because if somebody gets a debt, so you may get a flag as the as pro, as Centrelink processes um, debt. Or, the somebody's supposed debt, um, you'll get a flag. You'll get flags throughout the year, wouldn't you? That wouldn't necessarily be seasonal. Um, so I, I, I'd have again. I'd have to take it on notice, Senator. But I think we do. It's not ent entirely seasonal in that I think there is a process in DHS where each year they do a, I think what they call a true up type of process, which it, uh, at the end of. Uh, at the end of each year, okay. I think True in sort up. of a, a, a July, August, they they work out the year's results. So does that automatically remove existing flags if they haven't got a debt anymore, just out of interest? Uh, That's a good question. Yeah. So, so if somebody's Senator, been flagged at some point and then obviously the next 12 months comes around and they do it, does everybody who's had one before, does that drop off? Look, Senator, <coughs> I, I'd have to take that on notice. I'm, I'm sorry. That okay. So true up is a, rec is it a reconciliation of what debts are owed, is that what you mean? Yes, yes, Senator. Okay. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, you very much. Um, Mr. Horshawn, uh, uh, Hershorn, Hershorn, sorry. And yes. Mr. Lucchese. Lucchese, thank you very much. Um, does it concern you that the federal court has indicated that the demand for payment of an alleged debt first made by the respondent to the applicant of 6th of March, I'm referring to the Amato case, was not validly made. And yet the ATO have been implicated in the recovery of um, not lawfully issued notices by the government. What steps have you undertaken to ascertain the scale of exposure that you've, uh, that, that is now a consequence of the, your relationship with DHS? Um, so Senator, I, I, uh, I will not give uh, an opinion. Uh, my my request is for what action have you taken, given the extraordinary statements that have come from the federal court about the government issuing garnishing notices that were not lawfully issued through the ATO? Well, Senator, I think we would see that as primarily a matter for DHS. Okay, and DHS are going to say that you know that they've seconded work out to you, and the the gap is the great cavern in between where people have fallen, and many have not climbed out of that with debts that they don't owe. So I, I, I want to be sure, Mr. Hershorn, that you are taking steps to interrogate the data that's coming from DHS, because it's got to be clear to everybody now that there are unlawful. Um, notices that have been sent out to a close to a million Australians by this government. Well, Senator, I would say the validity of the debt is a matter for DHS. And you don't care that the ATO is going to continue to garnish these people? Well, Senator, How many people have you got in your system who are caught in this? So, Senator, I'm sorry, I don't understand. How many question. people have you got caught up in the ATO system who you are garnishing either wages or or family tax benefit or their tax return because they have been served an invalid notice for debt by the federal government? How many? So, Senator, first I would say we, we, we are there to garnish people. We, well, we are, the DHS can garnish, effectively garnish tax refunds through, through us. We, okay. we don't garnish other things. We don't we don't do the, the garnishing. We are the garnished, in a way, and it's the we, in a sense, follow the uh, 
you know, we are, are requested to, uh, in a sense, take some of the refund and provide that to DHS. Uh, we are not in the business of double guessing whether the debt is valid or not. How can you, ta if, if it's been found to be unlawful, if a debt is found to be unlawful, how can you not question then, now when you're given debts, that they are lawful? Sorry, through you, Chair, can I maybe just clarify here that you're, you're merely the facilitator as opposed to the person that's actually instigating the debt. So perhaps there's a little yes. lack of clarity uh, by my colleagues here as to who, uh, no, what the no, actual no, role Chair. is, to what the Chair, ATO no, that, is that versus That is a misrepresentation. I'm absolutely clear about the outrageousness well, I'm, of I'm not quite sure you are because the ATO is the facilitator of collection Look, of the debt for DHS meeting, as opposed that, Chair, to the hang I'm on, generator of right. questioning interrupted. Hang on. All I've right. got enough to get through today without that sort of nonsense. Do you want to keep going? Thank you. Oh, can you answer my question well, in terms of how can you not question when you are asked to garnish somebody's tax return, now that the process has been found to be, to be unlawful, in this particular case, and obviously the government thinks others are unlawful given they've suspended the process to the way, in the way in which it was operating, how can you then not question when you are asked to garnish someone's tax return that it is lawful, that, that so-called debt has been uh, lawfully processed and determined? Well, Senator, I, I would say that we rely on the competence of DHS and that when they say that a debt is due, that it is due. Have, and yet you've had no discussion. Now that a, this particular debt has been found to be unlawful, and we'll find out about other debts shortly, hopefully, how can you then not then go back and question the department about whether the debts that you are being asked to collect, because essentially that's what you're doing, how can you not question whether those debts are lawful? Can we just clarify that the unlawfulness is still before the courts? So well, it well no, it we know for a fact one isn't, <laughs> is, is yeah. in fact unlawful. And the government obviously thinks that others are, otherwise they wouldn't have changed the process. Mm. But at the end of the day, it is still before the court, and it's a matter of opinion. We can have a conversation offline, guys. Yeah. The question the, I think the, the senator still and I, I want to know is: What action have you taken with regard to the robo debt outrage? Is the ATO continuing to garnish people's tax returns and any other payments, or is it only tax returns that you can garnish? So it's tax returns. Okay. So is the ATO continuing to garnish people's tax returns, despite what's been? found by the federal court with regard to robo-debt? Well, so I'd say, Senator, that if DHS tells us that a debt is due, we will continue, we will garnish as per normal. But uh, I think the, the, the answer there is that, by definition you're asking me about, given there's been a change in process, of course, if DHS has changed their process, there will be fewer debts that we garnish. The ones you already have in the system, though, you haven't frozen yeah. your determination to go ahead with those. You're just con you're continuing business as usual. So, Senator, in our system, we have a flag that DHS may have a debt, or DHS has told us they have a debt that they may wish us to garnish. If we do a refund, we give information when there's a refund due to DHS, and DHS tell us at that time whether there's a debt that they would like us to garnish. So there's, I think, uh, to answer your question, there's no sense that there are past debts lingering in our system waiting to be garnished. The, all there is on our system is a flag that DHS may be interested in, in having us garnish a refund. Okay, so it's still with DHS. Have you noticed a change in practice? Are they saying don't follow through when you send them a flag? What's the traffic so, like? So, Senator, I'd have to take in. I'd if have to take on take notice on the notice, flows of help. what's happened since. Have I've you been asked this. to remove any flags? Senator, I, I'd have to take that on notice. Could you take that on notice? Okay, so the process for the ATO. Uh, the Department of Human Services to garnish someone's tax return or fringe tech, fr um, family tax benefit. You only deal with the tax return, is that correct? So, Senator, I, look, I'll, I'll take it on notice, but my understanding is it is only from the refunds. 
Okay. But so I'll, I'll no interaction for the ATO with family tax benefit? Um, look, I, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Are there any other payments or entitlements the ATO will garnish or withhold? Um, again, Senator, I can't think of any, but I'd, I'd have to take that on notice. Um, with regard to wages being garnished? Um, so, Senator, uh, the tax office uh, can't... We, we don't have that capacity. I, I, we wouldn't... Gar I don't... Are you asking the question? So I'm just trying to yes. clarify the question. Yes. So I, I believe Whose that people's wages, wages be... can be garnished if they owe a debt to the Commonwealth. Do you facilitate that through the ATO? Okay. So the tax office may, in, in relation to tax debts, may make garnish may in very rare, extremely rare circumstances garnish wages. We would not garnish wages on behalf of other agencies. Okay. And how frequently do you? garnish wages? Uh, Senator, I'd have to take that on notice. I think extremely rarely, but I'll, I'd, I'd have to take if that on notice. If you could give me that over the last four or five years. But it's only in relation to tax debt, so not... But it, but yes. It is only in relation to tax debt. Um, what's the total number of tax returns or family um, tax benefit or other payments that are garnished each final year, or each financial year? So, Senator, that, I think that probably answered by the, the previous statistics. So the if Centrelink 45, 40, 74 and 66,000 for Centrelink garnishing? Is yes. that That's correct, yes, okay. Um, so I observe that in 16, 17, 45,000, there was a short, a small drop of four, down to 40,000. And then a very significant increase in 18, 19 up to 74,000. And 66,000 this year already to October. That is quite a significant increase in the number of people who have had their tax benefit, their tax return garnished? Uh, so, Senator, I would say I'd have caution on the 1920 year-to-date figures because it is, I suspect, highly seasonal. But yes, Senator, of course, there, you know, from the numbers, there was a significant increase between 17, 18 and 18, 19. And to what do you attribute that, Mr Herschel? Um, well, at, a, at the risk of um, being obtuse, that we've received more notices from DHS. Thank you. That's a very clear and helpful answer. Thank you. Um, what are the circumstances and what policies and procedures do you wrap around your determination to garnish a particular entitlement? Are there any principles, practices, policies? Um, so you're talking about how the ATO would garnish yes. uh, tax debts? Yes. From well, others, no, from no. third sources, or are you asking about how our process around garnishing debts on related behalf of to DHS? Centrelink? Yeah. Well, so, uh, Senator, the the process is as I set out that um, DHS will give us a flag of people who have a debt when um, we they lodge their tax return. We provide and there's a potential refund. We provide that information to DHS. DHS will then give us information as about how much of that refund should be garnished. So the, there is a clear link that between what the DHS tell you to do and these numbers that you've reported to us today of 74,000 people who had $63 million garnished in 1819. That was simply by request of DHS? Yes, Senator. And to be clear, you did no checking of the veracity of that debt. You assumed because it's a government agency that it would be practising within the law and you applied their policy in concert with them through the ATO. Is that correct? Well, Senator, I wouldn't say that we applied their policy. We, they told us the debt was due and requested us to garnish refund and we did. Okay. Um, can I just ask the... Have you done any of your had sought your own legal advice about the sub, either earlier or since Centrelink has changed their process? Have you sought any legal advice as to the fact that you're garnishing a particular debt, a so-called debt, um, based on what has now, and I understand the court, other court cases are on foot, 
<coughs> but this particular debt has found to be uh, unlawful. Has that not set any flags off for the department about uh, legality of the way you're garnishing tax returns? Um, so, Senator, I would say that um, we certainly read the newspapers and are aware um, of uh, the discussion. I'd have to take on notice whether we've received formal legal advice. Okay, thank you. Did you seek any legal advice? I thought I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Okay. So, uh, what, would, what would it take to trigger seeking legal advice? Is a, is a story in the newspaper enough or a letter from the minister? What, what would it take to trigger the ATO to go, oh, there's a problem here, we'd better find out about the legality of this? Well, I suppose, Senator, that's a, it's, a, it's a matter of, of, it's a matter of judgment uh, as to, you know, when we receive legal advice. Okay, if you can provide on notice any correspondence any um, logs of phone calls, any um, meetings called to discuss the change in policy with regard to the robo-debt program in particular. Can I just ask, um, I think it's the same, it's a similar question to, to my colleague, um, Senator Seawert, but with regard to the different social security payments, DHS flags, what else did they flag with you in addition to the robo-debt um, matters that you might garnish? What's um, the list? So I'd, I'd have to take it on notice, but we, are, we certainly do uh, some stuff under child support. Yes, because we got those figures from you. Yep. Okay, what about disability support pension? Um, I'd, look, I'd have to take that on notice, I'm afraid, Senator. Uh, what about youth allowance? Again, I'd have to take that on notice. And what about New Start? Um, I'd have to take that on notice, but I assume that was part of the the centre link. But I'd have to, sorry, Senator, th th this level of detail I don't have. Right. Thank you. If you could provide the detailed numbers over um, four years, five five years probably, if you can, with regard to what you've garnished with regard to each of the items that DHS lets you know that they want you to recoup funds Could for. Could you take that back to 2011, please? 2011, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it may be, Senator, that we don't have a split because we, but yeah, because we, we, it, we, we have the Centrelink level and the, because in yeah. a sense, again, we don't go behind the debts. No. We're told that there's a debt. Mm. At this stage for us, it's the, the, the underlying origin of the debt is not relevant to us. Or whether it's lawful. Mm. Whether it, well, whether it is lawful, like we will only, whether it is lawful is relevant, but we will inherently assume that a government agency issues lawful debts. Mm. Mm. Most Australians do. They're finding out that this government doesn't make that test. Mm. So no, I can't comment on that. that um, Senator Askew or Senator Hughes, do you have any questions? No, I think we're just conscious of time, so probably no. Not. Thanks. Okay. Um, we single did want to payment. ask about single touch yep. payroll. Can you outline to us where it's up to? Sure. Um, so we currently have around about 561,000 employers that are now um, using single touch payroll. Um, so single touch payroll was uh, split into two phases. So for substantial employers, uh, to transition into single touch power from 1 July 2018 through to 30 June 2019. Can I just ask what a substantial employer is? Yes, sorry, uh, Senator. So that's uh, anyone has 20 or more employees. Thank you. Is for substantial. Uh, so we currently have around about 98% of all substantial employers now um, using single touch payroll. From 1 July this year through to 30 June uh, 2020, um, small employees, so 19 or, or less employees. Um, tr uh, to, uh, to transition across to single touch payroll. So we around, have around about 64% of all small employers now are reporting through single touch payroll. So, um, so we recognise that as we did for our substantial employers, that it's a transition year. So to give employers time to transition across into the new reporting framework. How many um, employers are operating in Australia? What's the raw numbers? Uh, it's around about, um, uh, that fall into under single touch payroll, around 800,000. 
and which ones are how many are substantial and how many are small. Um, So substantial employees are around about uh, 80,000 and uh, small uh, around about 740,000, so yeah. Okay, so um, in terms then of the number of employees, is that? Yep. So currently under those that are transacting in single touch payroll covering about 11.5 million um, uh, individuals. That's the total. Are you able to give us for the substantial and the the under the number of employees per yeah, your um, category? Yeah, yeah. Can, can you? Sorry, Senator. No, I'm trying to find out under the substantial how many employees and how many under the less than twenty. We can provide. I don't have that with me. Okay. That split today, but yes, we can provide that. Take that on notice. Yeah, take okay. that on notice. So that means that just so that I've got it right, single touch. So they're reporting live, basically, yep. uh, employees. That, that's right. Hours, so, well, tax, uh, hours worked. So what they're reporting is that each, each pay event or each payday, okay. they're reporting their, um, their tax and super information through to the ATO as they pay their employees. Okay. And uh, Senator, I might clarify that there's uh, Sometimes it's called phase one and phase two. Yep. So at the moment, it's uh, the single touch uh, payroll reporting is limited to uh, relatively few fields. Uh, I what think there that, are. Sorry. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. So at the what moment, do you mean it's things, fields? So like uh, pay, tax withheld, super. Yep. It doesn't have a. So it, it's it's really about how much was paid. There are, I think, there's still in a couple of bills, yep. which of course we can't be advocate for or against bills. But there are a couple of bills in front of or coming up to Parliament which talk about adding additional fields, yep. uh, primarily around things like child support, uh, reasons for uh, termination, and other pieces of information, hmm. which is sometimes referred to as single touch payroll phase two. Right. Okay. So, for the intent of purpose, for the for the purposes of of what we're looking into, which is Centrelink's compliance framework, phase one provides the information that's required in order for them for more instantaneous reconciliation with income support payments. Yep. Is my yes. understanding of the process is that, that correct? That, that's correct. And just building on what Mr. Hirshon had to say was around that the phase two gives a further breakdown of the information that's reported. So, for example, um, gross information broken down by, for example, allowances or you know different different components of what what rolls up into a gross payment. So that's in the part of phase two. Do you mean? So do you mean allow when you say allowances? Yeah. What do you mean? So for, so, for example, Senator, if someone, um, uh, just a practical example, if someone works in a, um, uh, in a freezer section, they might get um, a, a particular type of allowance for working in that particular department. <coughs> so it's an allowance that forms part of their overall salary. But so it's, would that not be included in their pay? It so is part for, of ro it. for the intents and purposes of compliance, yep. all the, that is all reported correct. in phase one, is that correct? correct? But yep. it enables you to break down and get a better understanding of... In phase two. In phase two that, of the nature of, of what people are earning. That's correct, Senator. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I ask what preparations the ATO has made for information to be shared between your agency and services, the new Services Australia? Yep. Um, so uh, we currently have a, an MOU uh, in place between uh, the ATO and, um, and DHS, uh, which sets out the provisions around um, that exchange of information. Um, so at the moment, um, any uh, single touch payroll data is only to be used for discovery purposes only in terms of understanding the, the data. Um, and that's then obviously governed by the appropriate law and controls and protocols in terms of around the, um, the sharing of that information. So that information can only be shared where there is a mutual client um, in terms of around with, uh, according to our records and to DHS's records. Okay, so before you, you're giving a great what answer, is, but I just want to go back and interrogate a little. Mean? Yeah, what, what is discovery? 
Yeah, okay. so basically... And what is a mutual client? Yeah, so, uh, so when we talk about discovery in terms of just understanding the data, so just working through it... So they can't use it, they to, can't use it for to raise debts? No, correct. At the moment? It's only to be used for discovery purposes only, so in terms of just understanding the data, in terms of around... Because um, STP data is a, is a new data set that's been reported, so it's about understanding in terms of what's, uh, what's being reported. But what's the intention further down the track and at what point of time will it move from discovery to use? Um, so, um, so that is um, subject to um, uh, a cross-agency uh, committee that, um, that is represented by um, ATO officials, um, um, uh, DHS officials and others um, in terms of getting an understanding in terms of moving from each of those particular stages. So um, I don't have with me in terms of around the timing in terms of the progression of those, but they must be agreed by those, that committee before it progresses from each stage. Could you take that on notice? Yep. To give us a detailed answer, but what's your sort of general sense of the timeline? Um, so in terms of around working um, uh, around with a, a 1 July 2020 date is in terms of around starting to, um, to use that data. For, de for um, reconciliation against... So the, the agreed stages are from a discovery stage, then into a pilot, so to do it in a pilot sense, and then from a pilot then would move into production, but each have approved stage gates that are articulated as part of the MOU. Okay, so you'd go into a pipe there. The anticipated approach is on 1 July 2020, you'd go into a pilot stage of using data, for example, for then reconciliation with, com with the compliance system. Yeah, so there, there would be in terms of around how DHS would then use that, that information. So that's, um, so without um, being able to articulate exactly the dates in terms, because there are a, a different sort of scenarios in terms of around how that data might be might be used. Yep. Um, that's something I'm happy to take on notice. Thank okay. you. And, and Senator, I, I would add that I think uh, the the ultimate aim of DHS, as I understand it, is that this information would be pre-populated into people's estimates, so that so that when people uh, had to disclose their income each fortnight, it would already be there in their forms, which is a much, obviously much greater convenience if things are pre-filled rather than having to uh, work them out yourself. This is where someone's earning regularly, you mean? Well, so, uh, so when somebody's earned income from an employer, as, as we have uh, more and more complete take-up of single-touch payroll across the employer community, more and more of that will be made available in a way that it can be put in pre-populated people's uh, disclosures each fortnight. So can I ask the averaging question at this point of time? Is that going to be averaged data that gets pre-populated or is it going to be specific data okay, that so relates to the lumpiness of people in insecure employment across this country? Okay, so, and, uh, so Senator, this is because it's based on real time when people are paid, <laughs> it's based on their actual income and it would be based on when they are paid. And uh, my understanding is also that ra at, in the past, people have had to estimate they're not how much they got paid, but es do the quite complicated task of estimating how much they earned during a period. So work out how many hours they haven't yet been paid for. My understanding is that the system is moving more to how much they've been paid during a period. And th so this data will, is by definition linked to how much people were paid during a period. And how often are they going to have to check it and report it? So, um, so my understanding is that at the moment, sorry, uh, I'm probably straying well outside my expertise, is that people have to report every fortnight. Single touch payroll data will be available every day. Okay, that's quite helpful to understand. Okay, we're gonna have to wind yep. up. Just to check the timing, discovery, pilot, production, is that the three terms that you used? Yeah, so discovery, then pilot, then production. And the 1 July 2020, is that production or pilot? Um, that's something I need to take on notice Senator, okay. in terms of that. Yeah. Um, the last thing, if I can, um, are you aware of legislation that's necessary to implement the budget measure? So, yeah, aware of there are there are two uh, pieces of legislation. So one is around the, the change of assessment model legislation, and there is another uh, piece of legislation as part of the Treasury Bill around the collection of um, child support, uh, allowing the Commissioner to collect child support uh, reported information. And um, when do you expect that legislation to be, to be before, before the Parliament passed? 
Um, my, my understanding, uh, Senator, is around that that um, I think is uh, scheduled for um, the autumn um, sitting next year, is my understanding. But that's uh, possibly a question for, for DSS. Yep. And if I can, just one final question. Um, if you could provide any more detail about the preparation for the bill, that would be very helpful. Yeah. But has the ATO received any ministerial briefings on implementation of data sharing between the ATO and DHS Services Australia? So have we received any, any briefings, any ministerial, any ministerial briefings? briefings on implementation of data sharing? Um, look, I'd have, to, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Um, if you have, Mr Hershorn, could you please provide that to the committee? in full, any uh, details, any documents about can the briefings. And can we just clarify what mutual clients are? Yeah, sure. So, so Senator, a mutual client is around a client that exists on an ATO record and also exists oh. on a Centrelink record. So... I oh, know. What was that? Sorry? An, on, exists on an ATO record oh, okay. and also on a Centrelink record. So the two match. Right. OK. Thank you. Um, no other questions? No. Any other notes? Thank you very much for your time today. Um, when do we need answers back? OK. So we'll get in contact about um, all the questions that you took on notice. Thank you. Uh, on notice, could I just ask Mr... The, um, the witnesses, if you could provide some detail about um, private privacy information concerns about the ATO's practice of debt recovery and oh, okay. sharing the information yeah, of Australians with the private sector recovering debt. Okay. Yeah, okay, so Senator, we can... Would you give us some details about what's going on? Because look, there are increasing concerns about uh, the sharing of data, especially in light of the incorrect nature of the DHS adv advice to you. Okay, Senator, we can... It, I'm not sure... So. So our discussion today has, has been stuff which uh, has been about things where we do not use debt collectors, okay? Because we have by, defini by definition, you know, using your been own sending system. people a smaller refund than we otherwise would have. Yep. So there's no, just to clarify, I mean, there's no use of debt collectors in this area by us. Thank you. Okay. Um, mid January for answers, if that's um, achievable, that would be fantastic. Thank I'm, sure you. My, I'm sure my staff are cursing me for their Christmas right now. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Can I please invite now representatives from the Department of Human Services or Services Australia, Social Services and Employment Skills, Small and Family Business to come up, please. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, right, before we begin, can I, you were all here, I think, and heard all my opening statements. Um, can I ask each of you to give us your names um, and the capacity in which you appear for the Hansard record, please? Um, I'm Ros Baxter. I'm Deputy Secretary, Integrity Information at the Department of Human Services. Welcome. Craig Storen, General Manager, Customer Compliance, Department of Human Services. Good morning, Senators. Shane Bennett, Group Manager, Participation, Payments and Families. Uh, Jason McNamara, General Manager, Integrity Modernisation Division in uh, DHS. Uh, Anthony Seebeck, General Manager, Debt and Appeals, Department of Human Services. Good morning, Janine Pitt. 
First Assistant Secretary for Employment Programs and Activation at the Department of Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. And I'm Benedicta Jensen, First Assistant Secretary, Labor Market Strategy Division at the Department of Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. Yeah. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Does anyone want to make an opening statement? Yes, Chair, I would like to. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity. The Department provides services to millions of Australians throughout different stages of their life, and we recognise that their circumstances are diverse and sometimes complex. Our compliance and business integrity systems seek to ensure that only eligible people receive payments and that they receive the right amount. Where a customer receives money they're not entitled to, we're obliged to seek recovery. These checks and balances help to protect the integrity and sustainability of Australia's welfare system, which helps to support vulnerable Australians. It's critical that we continue to respond to emergency situations and declared disasters such as bushfires and flood events, providing prompt and targeted support. I wanted to take a moment today to clarify, firstly, the implications of the Amato order for the Income Compliance Program. Secondly, outline the enhancements that we've made to the program and thirdly, address some misconceptions that we've observed in some of the commentary on this issue. Chair, if possible, because this is quite detailed, is there any way we could get a digital copy sent so we could have a hard copy in front of us to At the same time, to? we'll check if that's something we can do. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, so to the first matter, the Federal Court of Australia made orders in the matter of Amato and the Commonwealth of Australia on 27 November 2019. In that matter, the court declared by consent of the parties that the alleged debt wasn't validly made. The alleged debt in that case had been calculated solely based on apportionment of ATO pay-as-you-go data, income data. The court orders broadly reflect that the conclusion that a debt was owed based on ATO pay-as-you-go income data wasn't open to the decision maker in that case because the applicant hadn't earned income in equal fortnightly amounts. There are just, two. Can I just clarify for the record, so that people reading this, who is the decision maker in that sentence that you've just referred to, Dr Baxter? The decision maker in the Amato yeah. case? Yes. DHS. So that's the government, the, the Commonwealth government? That's right. Thank you. Um, there are two related matters which are currently before the courts, including, I think as everybody's aware, a current class action, and therefore we're not able to go into the legal intricacies of the Amato matter any further. In terms of the enhancements we've made to the program, the department is committed to continually improving our systems and services to meet the needs of the Australian community. While we have an important role in ensuring the integrity of the welfare system, we're committed to ensuring that the systems, processes and products we use are accessible and user-friendly. Over the life of the program, we've worked with customers and with stakeholder groups to make it easier for people to connect with us and to use our online systems. We listen and we respond. As detailed in our submission to this inquiry, the program's online system has been significantly improved since its inception in 2016. The QP system was built using human-centred design principles to improve the customer experience and make it easier to use. Our communication to customers has also improved. We've made the system easier to use and we also have well-staffed, dedicated phone lines with short wait times so that people can access support and assistance as required. The refinements announced by the government on 19 November represent the next iteration of the program. We have continued to work with our customers and staff to refine the program. We've continued to work in partnership with third parties such as non-government organisations and the Ombudsman's Office. And we've listened to the evidence provided through public hearings as part of this inquiry. Given this context, it was reasonable for government to review our processes in delivering the income compliance program. The refinements will improve the customer experience and make the program more robust by requiring additional information when using ATO data to calculate over potential overpayments. As we make these changes, we're committed to ensuring that the customer is at the centre of the design and implementation of them. We will use a test any new products, processes and correspondence with customers with staff and with third party organisations. Income compliance activities are not ceasing. We continue to be required to ensure that people receive the right payments at the right time and that any overpayments are recovered. The department will continue to use ATO information to identify significant income discrepancies. However, 
we will no longer raise a debt based solely on averaging of ATO income information. In terms of the impact of this change on customers, the department is undertaking an analysis of all online income compliance reviews to identify and prioritise those cases where income averaging was used to, to, to determine a debt. The process we've developed to do that is robust and it contains quality checks to ensure we identify all of those who are affected. Compliance staff are manually analysing individual customer records to identify those customers who are in scope. The department will contact affected customers once they are identified. Customers do not need to do anything for this to happen. It will take time to check individual records, particularly for complex cases, so we appreciate people's patience while we do this. As we identify cases where income averaging was solely used to determine debts, the department will freeze collection of outstanding debts. People can contact the department on our dedicated line 1800 061 838 if they have any concerns relating to their income compliance review. And as is always the case, people can ask for a reassessment at any time or for a formal review of these decisions. While we are making these changes to the program, it's important to note that the broader debt raising and recovery program will continue business as usual. I'd like to now turn to some of the evidence provided through these public hearings. We've been listening to the feedback that's been provided by customers and by third party organisations. This is informing future directions for the program and it will continue to do so. However, along the way, we've also heard a number of misconceptions about the income compliance program and we'd like to address those briefly here. These misconceptions can cause confusion, distress and frustration. So firstly, in terms of human involvement in the program, there continues to be a misunderstanding that the income compliance program is an automated system with no human involvement. As we detailed in our submission, our staff are involved at every stage of the income review process, from the selection of who is reviewed, through to assisting customers with their review, to calculating overpayments, recovering debts, and also the review and appeals process. The decision making is done by staff, not by robots or by automation. Detail flowcharts that we provided at attachment B to our submission show the extent of staff involvement at each point of that process. The second issue I wanted to take a moment on is the issue of the initial letter versus a debt letter. We've heard a lot of evidence about the letters we use to engage with people and that there is some confusion about what constitutes a debt letter. It's important to recognise that that first letter provided to customers is not a debt letter. It's a request for customers to check and update their past income. If an income compliance review does result in a debt, customers then receive an explanation of the debt and are able to, ask a custom, ask, able to ask a customer service officer to provide an explanation at any time. Can I just check, Ms Baxter? No, can we just get to the end of the opening statement? With that bit, are you still please? requiring people to go back seven years? Can we just get, hang on, that? hang can on. Can we just get let's, the opening statement through? All right, please? just hang on. Let's wait and let's finish the statement. Yeah, There's only a few minutes the left. Thanks. There are only a few minutes to go. Um, those letters are ones that the department has worked very hard on. We've engaged with customers and third party organisations to continually improve those letters. They're accessible and they're user friendly and they help people to understand their obligations. Um, a customer from Melbourne who'd recently we spoke to had gone through the old online compliance initiative program, was recently shown the new QP initiation letter and she commented that you can see they're really trying to make it less scary and demanding. They're trying to say, let's work together to sort this out. The final, um, the final two points I wanted to raise relate to the use of external collection agencies and tax garnishes, which I know has been the focus of some discussion this morning. The use of external collection agencies has come up on a number of occasions. Use of ECAs to recover debts to the Commonwealth is not new. We have been using ECAs to recover debts, certain social welfare debts, from people who are not our customers any longer since 1996. ECAs make up an important and effective component of the department's overall debt management strategy. The department does not refer debts of current customers to ECAs. For referral of a case to an ECA to occur, the debtor must be no longer in receipt of a social welfare payment, must have an outstanding debt amount of $50 or more, and must not have entered into or maintained a suitable recovery arrangement with the department. 
The department closely monitors the performance, behaviour and debt collection process of our external collection agents. In terms of tax garnishing, that's another area where there has been some negative discussion. Again, recovering debts through the garnishing of tax refunds is not new. The department garnishes tax refunds, wages and bank accounts in accordance with the law and established processes that have been in place for more than two decades. This is permissible under a range of acts where a person has failed to enter into a reasonable arrangement to repay their debts and other attempts to recover money owed have failed. Before taking these steps, we make reasonable efforts to contact the person and consider carefully their individual circumstances. As a matter of practice, the department does not garnish tax returns where a person is a current customer, where a person is bankrupt or entering bankruptcy, where they're impacted by a natural disaster, where they're incarcerated, or where they're experiencing short-term hardship or domestic violence. So in conclusion, we will continue to work with customers and stakeholders to make improvements to the system. We'll continue to consider the information and evidence provided before this inquiry and improve the system where that's required. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, there's a whole lot of questions and I'm hoping what we can do is go through the questions in subject to areas. Sure. Um, what I'd like to do first is to further clarify what's happening right now in yes. terms of the system, the changes that have been made, sure. and then we'll go from there. Sure. So thank you for the um, outline of where we're up to. It didn't, in fact, answer all the questions that um, I certainly have about what's happening now. Um, I want to go to legal issues um, as, a, as a bit of a separate topic because I know that we're going to have lots there. How many people, the minister in his relatively short statement, uh, Minister Robert, um, made following the changes that were articulated, um, basically in an email that was leaked, uh, said there was a small number, a relatively small number, what's that effect, of people affected. Could you please tell us, uh, have you, what are the numbers? Have you, um, in fact, got an idea of the size of the cohort that are involved here? Thank you, Chair. Um, we are, Senator, we are currently working through the process of trying to understand how many people are going to be affected by this change. So there's not a number that I can give you today. We're doing this as quickly as we can, as quickly as possible, consistent with our obligation to take all due care. In the opening statement, I did refer to the manual process that we've developed um, in order to do this identification. I can tell you that it's a very robust and highly manual process. It does involve checking all the customer records of people who've had debts raised under the online income compliance system. Um, it also involves a very uh, robust QA process, both initially in the setting up of that manual identification process and then on a case-by-case -case basis to quality assure and check that as each um, review is looked at, that it's getting the right answers and that we're ensuring we err on the side of including everybody who should be included in that group in the group. So at the moment, no, we don't have an answer, but I can assure you that we're working as quickly as we can, consistent with our obligation to take great care on this, to identify the number of customers who might be affected. Okay, so we actually don't know if, in fact, it is a small number. If you don't, if, if you can't answer the question about how many, in fact, the minister can't say, in fact, or was incorrect when he said there was, were implied there's a small number of people involved. Senator, is that of those people involved in the online income compliance system, not all of them used averaging, even in some part of their particular review. Well, how about um, give us those numbers? Because that, that, like, there's, there's no facts on the table here. You know, yes. you, you're, you're making relative <laughs> claims. You've got to be making that on the basis of some numbers somewhere. Well, we do know that in our review processes, we have not had um, occasion in every instance to use averaging. So we know that it won't be all of the cases in the online income compliance review system that have used some averaging. We also know that... So, so interrogating what you just said then, how many of those that you have reviewed? Like, give us a proportion. I, I'm afraid I'm just not able to do that, Senator. I've explained to you the process that we're working through. It is a very manual process. I don't have a number I can provide you with today. 
What I can tell you is that not all of the cases in the online income compliance system used averaging. Of those that did use averaging, not all of those debts would be determined differently if averaging was not used, because in very many cases people do earn their income on an average basis across a year. And we are working through with all due diligence to try to work out what those numbers are. Okay. So are you reviewing – did I understand what you said? You're reviewing every debt? So we are reviewing all debts raised under the online income compliance system, all reviews undertaken where a debt has resulted. Yes, that's correct. All reviews – sorry, where there was a debt? All reviews okay. in the online income compliance system where a debt's been raised. Okay. Um, what timeline are you – when did it start? When did this process start? So we began the process of developing a process for identifying these cases and beginning the identification of cases as soon as the decision was announced by the government, um, and we're undertaking that process now. So has the pro – so I note your words very carefully just then was we started the process of starting the process. Well, I, I guess the way what I'm I wanting to emphasise there is we didn't just go off immediately and start looking through reviews. Yeah. We wanted to develop a very robust business process. Okay. We have a lot of people engaged in this and we wanted to make sure that they had a process they could follow that would make sure we identified absolutely yeah. every review it, that might have had some average. It wasn't a criticism of no. you working a process. It was a, it, I noted that that started. Yeah. When did the actual implementation of the process start? So it started shortly after that. So it, it may have been a period of a week or two. I'd, I'd have to okay. take that on notice. But it did take some time to get a business process in place okay. that we were certain would be able to identify all of those people who might be affected and that we could ensure our staff understood that that included if averaging was used in some part of the review process. So preparing that business process, testing that business process to make sure that it would work, training people in that business process and then beginning the process of going through all of the reviews are the steps that we've been undertaking. Okay, thank Chair, you. can you help me? Because I'm a little confused about the, the where do people who've actually just paid the debt when it arrived because they were so distressed? Yeah, that's, that's what I want to come into too, because who, that, the different cohorts. Yes, yeah, because yeah. what does reviewed mean? Does that mean somebody actually said, like, look, I don't owe you this, so they've triggered a review? So a review what about all the I people who just paid because they were scared? reviews yeah. and used. There's the review that's undertaken at the beginning of the whole process, yep. and then there's reviews if you, if you ask for it to be reviewed. That's correct, so when I, when I talk about the reviews that we're looking at, yeah, I'm which talking one about you? all of the reviews that we've done under the online income compliance okay. program. So it's not um, the formal review process where someone gets a decision and they seek a review of that decision. I'm talking about reviews in the sense of reviewing cases to determine if a debt exists. So, so even if people just got it and they didn't question anything and they, and said, they, paid, oh, it. And they paid it, you're reviewing yes. those ones as yes, well? we okay. are. That's, we're reviewing okay. all of them. Yeah. Um, so just to get back to the timeline, you can't tell me when exa exactly when <coughs> the formal process started of this, uh, the new review. So the identification, the identification of the people who might yes. be in this cohort. Now, I, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I can say we worked as quickly as we could as soon as the decision okay. was announced to build the business process, test right. the business process, train the people and, and get them going on doing this identification of reviews. Okay, if you could take that on notice, if it's possible for someone to find out before we go today, that would be useful. Mm -hmm. um, the process, can you take us through how many people are involved in this process? How many? How many, so you've said a lot of people are involved. Yes. Have you employed new staff? What are the number of staff involved? And for how long is, do you anticipate this process being undertaken? So no, we have not retained new staff for this process. We have been deploying um, a large proportion, I, I couldn't tell you the exact number, but a large proportion of our, our compliance workforce has been deployed immediately to this process of identifying these customers who might be in this group. How large um, is your compliance workforce, Dr Baxter? Uh, it's approximately 1,500 people working on the online income compliance Okay, program. and what's a large proportion? Um, it would be at least half. So 750 people. I'd, I'd, I'd have to take on notice the exact amount, but it's, a, it's within that realm. Okay, thank you. Um, can you take us through the process 
for well, how long do you, and sorry, I'll, I'll continue with the, my next question. That, um, in terms of how long you anticipate the review process being undertaken? Um, so we expect to have this cohort, the cohort who may have had um, some income averaging use as a sole basis of debt, we expect to have that cohort identified early in the new year. I, I couldn't give you a more definitive date than that because we're still working through it, but we expect to know early in the new year. How many cases have you reviewed today? Um, I'd have to take that on notice. It's a it's a changing number from day to day, as you appreciate with that many people. If you know that much, Dr. Reviews. Baxter, can you give us the most recent information? I, like, th there is huge community interest in this. We've we've called you because of the extraordinary circumstances that exist. It's not unreasonable for us to expect that you would come with answers about the scale, which involves some real numbers. We're talking around the edge. You're planning for a workforce of 750 people to respond to what? How did you determine that were 750 people needed if you have no idea of the scale? Well, I mean, I can. we've already discussed, Senator, that we're beginning with the number of online income compliance reviews How many that are resulting in a debt. How many is that? Those, those numbers are a matter of public record in our submission to this inquiry. It is um, the number that was provided to this inquiry, let me make sure I've got it right for you, is um, so in our submission that was provided to you as at 31 August, um, that number was 734,000 online income compliance reviews that have been completed with a debt. Okay. Oh, and I'm sorry, Three quarters that, of a million sorry that number is actually, Senator, just to correct that, that number is the whole measure. So that doesn't only include pay-as-you-go um, income reviews, it also includes ones that relate to um, business income and bank interest also. So that, that 734,000 is the larger group, but a proportion of those would have the been bulk of those the ones in online. this particular. Yes. And, and the majority of that. So, yes, you know, to be generous, is it what seven hundred thousand? Um, Senator, I, I couldn't tell you what the exact number is. That's what we're working through at the moment. But it's not. It's not two thousand. It's the bulk of that number. So, it's not the bulk of that number that would have had some income averaging applied to their debt. As I said at the beginning, we are starting with the pool of online income compliance program reviews that have related to this pay-as-you-go income data. Then there's only a proportion of those which would have been determined using income averaging as the sole basis of the debt. And then as you work through that, there's only a proportion of those that had they been, had that debt been calculated not using only income average data, where the debt would have changed. So it's certainly not the entire amount that I've just indicated. Okay, so let's go back. So. You've done. If you take off the business, that smaller group out of the 734,000 of which there's, what Senator O'Neill was referring to is not. It was the bigger group that are being assessed. So the bigger group that's being assessed, because you've said all online compliance debts raised are being reviewed. That that fall into this category. That fall into yep, this category. Right. So what Senator O'Neill was referring to, I think, out of the when she said 700,000 was taking off a proportion that were not the online compliance. So uh, I'd, I'm sorry, I'd have to take on notice what that amount is. 734,000 is the number of reviews completed with debt that relate to the whole program. Some of those relate to other pieces like bank yes. interest reviews, business and income reviews. I don't have that number with me, I'm sorry. Um, but yes, the majority of those are pay as you go. Right. So reviews. we've estab established that. What I'm trying to find out is how many have been reviewed to date? And I'm sorry, I don't have that number with me, Senator. That is a, a, a changing figure from day to day, in fact, from hour to hour, because as we've identified, we do have um, large numbers of compliance officers working on these reviews. So, hang on. Yep. So how many have you identified are solely income averaging? So do you have a percentage? So no, I don't have a percentage and I don't have a number that I can give you at the moment because we are working through that process. In addition to going through each of the reviews, um, we also, after those reviews are completed, they go through a quality assurance process and I'm just not confident to give you the number of where that process is up to. I can tell you that we do expect that all of them will be worked through by early in the new year, um, but I can't tell you where we're at in that at the moment. And I think 
to, to, to attempt to give you a number at this stage could be misleading because, as I've indicated, there are a number of processes to that review, <coughs> including this quality assurance process. We have some um, people who are working through the process who have been doing it for longer and are more adept and, and we're more confident with in terms of the quality assurance of those cases. Others are coming online. So it's a process of being more confident that people are able to deploy the business process appropriately and identify the cohort. Can, can I ask okay. a HR question? H how did you determine that roughly half of your 1,500 people would be pulled off whatever they were doing and go to this? How did you determine the scale of response if you have no numbers on which to base the determination of your workforce? Um, so or is it just this is you know panic mode, pull half the workforce, and then let's just try and clean up the mess we've got? So Senator, I might um, ask Mr. Storen to comment on this, but I will say this: this has not been done in a panicked way. This has been done in a very planned way. I've explained to you the business process that we've worked through. So you we've planned to at... send out debt notices that were invalid. Hang on, hang on. Can we just step through? You've asked a question. Yep, thanks. Dr. Baxter was trying to answer it and get Mr. Storen to Sorry, Chair. I, I just, response. like you, there's so many people who are so distressed about this. They expect us to reflect that as well. Yeah. Yeah. But and I do appreciate the answer and I would like Mr. Storen. So if I, if I could just, before I hand over to Mr. Storen, though, just to go what you were saying about the, the sort of rush, I can assure you that this has been done in a, a very deliberate way to ensure we are getting the process right. So part of working out how many people we're going to deploy to it is looking at what does that process look like. It's also about looking at how many are available. This is a time of year where we do enter into a modified servicing um, period anyway, so we, we don't initiate um, new reviews after a particular date, and Mr Storen can talk to some of that. So it is a time when we do have some staff available to deploy to other activities, and in this case, we've made a decision based on the government's announcement to prioritise this work. We know it's important that people understand quickly if they're part of this cohort. So it makes sense in that balancing of how we're deploying our resources, just as we do at any other point during the year, to make sure we're deploying them to something that's a priority at the time. And Mr Storen can talk some more to how some of those assessments are made. Thank you, <coughs> Ms Baxter. Craig Storen, General Manager, Customer Compliance. So the initial stage of uh, putting staff into this did not involve approximately half the workforce from the beginning we escalated the inclusion of people and the largest driver of the availability was what we call our modified servicing arrangement period, which commenced on the 14th of November. We've done this annually since... Since 2016. Since, since back then, uh, the Chair will recall, where yes. we cease initiations of reviews before the Christmas period so that reminders and debts do not occur at a um, particularly sensitive period for this type of activity. So on the 14th of November, we um, entered the modified service arrangement period. We had staff available. We did have plans to look at um, finalising some other, dead, other activities that have been around, but we took the opportunity to redirect those staff to this activity. We also looked at a range of other things that we do in the employment income space. So in terms of the so compliance... Just before you go on, Mr Soren, can I ask you to say what it is that you took staff from in order to provide the staff for this clean-up operation? So we have um, initiated reviews with customers and past customers from both the Employment Income EIC program and the CUPE program that are out there with customers at the moment. We call that our work on hand. We were going to redirect um, our effort over the next month or two during the modified servicing arrangement period to contacting those customers. Some of those customers hadn't had opened to MyGov or had received an Australia Post registered but had not followed up with us. So we then make successive phone calls to try and contact the customer to accelerate the review. That was the work that we um, have diverted a proportion of this, the workforce onto to undertake this identification task. We also look at the range of other work that we have. So the compliance workforce have people that have skills across a whole range of different things that occur in compliance. It's not just about employment income, but we look at um, teams that have employment income experience, whether that's the OCI system, the EIC system or the QP system. We have an activity which we call our um, earned income intervention program, which is a 
intervention early on in the process before a customer actually receives income. We get advice from the tax office that a tax file number has Thank been activated know. and is likely to earn some income. We have an active program to reach out to customers and explain to them their um, obligations. So it was from that activity that we've also drawn in some staff because in terms of um, our annual program, we have staff available. We'll meet this year's expectations even with drawing some staff away. Okay, so that's how we've escalated up to nearly half the, the workforce okay. now being trained. Of course, we couldn't train them all immediately. So it's been a, a progression. Okay, thank you. In terms of the process that's actually being undertaken in the first instance, is that to identify people whose debts were solely related to income averaging? That's correct. Is that correct? Anybody, anybody that's had a debt on in, that. So no, not not all debts. <coughs> These are debts within the online income. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, that's yes. what I mean. But it, sorry, any of those yes. in the online that's right. process mm -hmm. that have had some form of income averaging, even if they've had a previous review. Review. Yes. It's very so, confusing sorry, using can, the word review so many times. Um, can I just through you, Chair, as well, also confirm yeah. that a lot of these people that are currently going through this review are people who potentially didn't engage with the department because a lot of the people who would have engaged with the department would have obviously provided additional information and so averaging wasn't used. So, 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 so the people that averaging has impacted or only potentially averaging has been used are the cohort that have potentially not engaged with the department. Would that be a correct assumption, Dr Baxter? No. So, Senator, we are looking at all of the reviews. Mm -hmm. And you're right, that will include some people who have not engaged, mm -hmm. and it will include people who have engaged, it will include people who have paid off their debts, as you indicated earlier. Yep. We'll but if people, people engaged and provided additional information, then obviously averaging wouldn't have been used. Well, that, that's or it wouldn't, have been, no, the, that's, it wouldn't that's, have been the only part used. So it, it's correct to say that there is a higher likelihood that if people engage with us, we were able to get other information yeah. and we would not have been required in those instances to use averaging in some, you know, in some of those cases. Yeah, so which is why, you know, when we talk about a limited cohort, it's, it's more likely to be those that didn't engage. Well, the reason I asked the question about the subsequent review is in the Amato case, there was a review mm. and it was wrong. Right. So, even though they've engaged, even though there's been a review, doesn't necessarily mean that the that they got it right. They got it right. That's so, why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it's not just for the people that that no, may have right. had a subsequent review of the decision? No. Is it? It's that's right. So both anybody that correct. was involved income averaging is that correct? Both things are correct. It's correct that we are looking at all of these in scope for online income compliance reviews where a debt has been raised. And it's also correct that if someone has engaged with us, it's far less likely that we would have had to use income averaging in their case because there would have been a greater likelihood that we would have had other material on which to rely. Yeah. Thank you. And the, subsequent to that, it, I know for a fact, because people have personally told me that they've just settled, even though they've had a review and the debt's been reduced, they still... They are also being looked at. They are still being looked at because they just got sick of fighting the system. And I'm, mm. I've had people tell me of their personal accounts of that, but I've also mm. heard through others of that happening. Yeah. Yeah. So what we are doing at this stage is the count, the identification of the cases that, where okay. income averaging so, has been involved. OK, so that's that first... The first wave of review, of review... Let's use the review in the sense of just this process. Yeah not all the other reviews that are going on. There's so many iterations. It's identification, it, I think, is what they were using. Yes, yeah. identification. The identification. Yes. So the uh, first wave the is identification. identification. of the in-scope cohort. OK. And then you'll get that by early in the new year. Yes. That's Does that correct. over January, I take it, means early yes, in the new year? I think so. So then what happens subsequent to that? So what... Sorry, what is the question? So you've identified... Yes. You're going through identifying the cohort that is in scope. Yep. Or having used income averaging, yes. then once you've identified the, that cohort, yep. where does the process go from there? Well, Senator, so for those reviews that we have in train at the moment, um, the government's been very clear that we will seek additional information. So if we have 
the kind of reviews that Mr Storan referred to that are already in train and that are in process, we're looking at what are the extra pieces of information that we might be able to go to. Um, for this group that you've identified, we're working hard at the moment to refine what will that new process be for them and what will the next steps be. Okay, so that is, you don't know. That is a, it, it is a, not unlike the identification, it is a complex piece of work to work through what do we do once we have identified this cohort. Um, part of the identification process is also understanding that these are not a single group. So some of your questions this morning have actually already gone to this issue. This, there's not a single group of customers that you have here. You have some customers who have had multiple reviews um, across different platforms over more than one year. Um, some have had multiple employers over a particular review period and they might have provided bank statements and pay slips for some but not for other parts of their process. And some might have multiple debts which all need to be individually examined. So identifying the cohort really matters because it actually affects the size and shape of what are the options that are available to us. Um, at the same time, we're working through what some of those options might be. Um, and, and obviously, the size of the cohort and the individual circumstances will affect um, the timing of how long particular options for, for dealing with that cohort might take and the cost. So we are, while we are engaged in a process of identifying the cohort, we are also involved in a process of working through options around different processes for managing that cohort once we have them identified. Okay, thank you. Dr. Can I Baxter, ask about cost? I just hang on, I want to come back to cost in a second. I just want to clarify, you haven't finalised the process. Once you've ID'd the cohort, and I understand there will be various scenarios within that cohort, but you're still working on the process of where to from there. Is yeah, that um, correct? What I certainly can tell you is that. For those, as we're identifying them, I mentioned in my opening statement, we are freezing recovery of their debts. So we are taking that step. So there will no longer be debt recovery. As you are identified through the process, your debt recovery is being frozen. And while we are doing that identification work, we are also doing this work of working through what could a new process look like for that group of people. How many people have had that debt frozen so far? So because that relates to the answer I provided previously in relation to how many people have been identified, because it's as you're being identified that your case is being frozen, I, I'm afraid I can't give you that. Somebody number. must know that, Ms Baxter. So yeah. that is a, it is a changing number from yep, day that's to okay. day. Tell us as of business today. yesterday. I don't care. But just give me a real number in real time, a I'll date and a time. I'll have to take that question. Surely there's notice. somebody who can provide that, because it must be known. Yeah. None of us at this table would know what that number is today, either of those who've been identified or of those who've had their debt recovery frozen. So what about Friday, last Friday? You must know. There's got to be a, there must be a You must be able to press a button and it'll tell you how many people you've identified. Um, and if not, why not? If it were as easy as pressing a button, I think we would have been able to identify the cohort more quickly than the process that I've identified. It is a complicated process. Surely they go I into a list. That easy. Surely they go into a list. It's it's and uh, and drones. So it is. You know, Fred blogs. How You've many identified people? them. It is a more complicated process than that. I've identified that it does involve quite a lot of manual investigation of records, and it then involves a quality assurance process. It then, at, after that stage, involves the process of going in and freezing the recovery of debt. So is it possible, Dr there, Baxter, that there isn't just one possible button to press, that there is you know, it, a slightly more complex, there is not a a complex, complex it, it procedure? It doesn't matter about the process. I'm interested in the facts. I'm interested in the facts. I'm interested in the facts. Yeah. That? No, no, no. I would. This is the, this is the yeah. thing. We're going into Christmas. The seven hundred thousand people potentially waiting for some information about this. We can't get a single number out of the department that's responsible. The, the department that has served illegal notices, debt notices on, well, potentially seven hundred. Yeah, exactly. We can't get a single number out of this department. They haven't mentioned one on number Wednesday, of so what I they've actually to, frozen. You know, watch our language here. But I think we can stand. Just ascertain here, Dr. Baxter, that there isn't one button that we can press here. I don't care about no. the button. I only care well, you're about asking about on. the button hang to be pressed on. to give you a hang number, on. so there isn't one button. Sorry. Let's get the number. There will be an identification process. Surely there will be a flag on a person that is identified going through this process. So you should surely be able to then work out the number that have been flagged already to tell us 
how many are there, whether it's how a button or whether it's a yeah. flag. It doesn't matter. So, well, so there, there is neither a button nor a flag. What there is is the pool that I've identified for you initially that are the starting pool that we're looking at, which is all of those ones in this part of the online income compliance program. And we've kind of worked through what the initial starting number yep. with some pieces taken away. So there is that number. Which is, then which we is are, what? We still haven't got clarity around that. So, well, I've given you the number that I'm able to give you, and I've taken somewhere the last of somewhere less than seven hundred and thirty-four thousand. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so we're beginning with that number. We're manually working through all of the reviews that have been undertaken, and the reason I can't give you a number about where do we sit with how many have been frozen, how many have been identified to date, is because that is it's it's a it's a multi-step process. You know, there is a process where but, but the we end, identify hang on, hang on, them. There's a process where we oh, quality assure to check that we've got that right. Yes, In some cases, we do a second quality assurance, yes. and then we go through a process of freezing recovery of their debt. And, and, and can, and can I just sort of say that t too that you've got to remember we haven't been counting this data set. So, in terms of um, a lot of the numbers that we're able to give you quite quickly, we have a set process for uh, abstracting those numbers and abstracting those numbers in a way that we're happy that we could give them to people and that they won't change and that they are accurate. This is a very new process. We have to actually work on the accuracy of those numbers. Yes, and Mr McNamara, I, I always appreciate that. But us. the problem has arisen because there was an accuracy in the design in the first place and people need this information. We're here on behalf of the Australian public so they have some they confidence, right? So we, they, they need to... 700,000 of them are waiting for your answers. Okay, six hundred will be hoping you've made a mistake and they get their, they're going to get money back before Christmas. That's the reality well, of what's out there. They're going to get it back before Christmas. You know, that oh, is no. very much in part to our concern. We know that people are closely watching this. <coughs> we know that people are listening and looking for information on this process. If I give you a number that is not an accurate number, it could well create a perception that we're a certain part of the way. Um, you know, through that process, we're still building that process as we go. We're still kind of building it as we work through these reviews. And I would hate to give an inaccurate perception of where we're at in case people do think, well, yes, this is likely to be solved for me next week. But the, what the, we do know is that we hope that we, we anticipate that early in the new year, we will have the full cohort identified. Um, and I'm reluctant to give you numbers that I just don't have we, at this time okay. because we, of some of those perceptions that we we'll create. Appreciate that you don't have the full cohort. We wanted to know how progress is going. Is I going. understand. Yes. So who do you communicate? When you, when you say we have stopped recovering debts, is that the ATO or there are other places that you're using to recover debts as well? So debts are recovered in a number of different ways, Senator. Yes. So there's debt recovery that we are responsible for within DHS. Um, and that is... Um, you know, things like recovering from, you know, regular re regular recovery from people's um, fortnightly payments. So, yeah. So that is, that's, that is debt recovery that is in our power to freeze. And as we identify a case, we freeze recovery of those debts. Okay. So how many of those have you done that to? So, Senator, I've explained to you now as much as I'm going to be able to tell you <coughs> about how many of the debts we've identified and how many of those debts have had their recovery frozen. And that is, I cannot tell you at this stage. I don't know what that number is today. It is a shifting number on a daily, hourly basis. But we anticipate that we will have those numbers identified early in the new year, and that we will also have recovered, we will have frozen recovery of those which have been identified by early in the new year. Oh, I, I'm so yeah, frustrated no, just, just at, at not being able to get a number yeah. on this. On. You might not want to give it to us, but I'm absolutely certain you know it, Dr Baxter. If you're freezing these, if Sorry, you're taking an action, are we getting a hangout here of Dr somewhere. Baxter somehow? You know, I mean, I'll just clarify. Dr can't. Baxter has taken the I question on notice. Yes, all right. I think we, move we will on? move on. Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm really aware that Senator Askew has a clarification. You said a clarification on that. You said that you've stopped, you're freezing, you removed or you freeze the recovery. Is the individual who is affected by this, which is what we're all concerned about, are they actually notified of that? Um, so the individual, as, um, as we identify them, we freeze recovery of their debt. They will know that recovery of their debt has been frozen because they will see that there is more money in their payment than they would otherwise have or that their recovery arrangement has been frozen. Um, we are working at the moment on a letter to, our, to inform customers that this is what's happened when their recovery is frozen. That's obviously um, 
a reasonably complex process because this is not an, an easy issue for people to understand. So we are working quite closely with customer cohorts to get that letter right. But we do hope to be able to send that letter out to them very soon, explaining to them that you are somebody who's been identified as being in scope for this change that we've made. We have frozen recovery of your payments in the meantime and we will let you know next steps in terms of your case as soon as we're able to. Well, the letters say we made a mistake hang and we're on, sorry. Hang on. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask you. So the continuation from that is obviously that if it's not sent out soon, they may have a misunderstanding that their debt's been fully repaid. So you don't have a time frame on the letters going out? or So, um, no, I don't, but we do anticipate it being very, very yeah. soon. Okay. So we have, we have developed a letter, we have yeah. done some user testing of that, we're doing some final testing, and then as soon as we can, for those people whose recovery has been frozen, they will get a letter explaining to them why that's happened. We also have a number of other communications that we've done more generally that you would be aware of, Senator. So we have material on our website. Um, we have ensured that all of our um, people who are answering the phone lines across the department have information that if people ring up and ask, they can explain to them. Our compliance line, which we our dedicated compliance line, which we refer people to, obviously has some more specific scripts that they can explain to people to understand what's happened. Material on the website and obviously the department's media statement um, and nurses' media statements about these issues as well. Okay, thank you, Jane. Can so just just double. Following up and clarifying that, no letters have gone out yet, although some people have had their debts frozen. Is That's that correct. correct understanding? That's correct. OK, thank you. Um, can I then go to when do you anticipate, just working on this timeline, when do you anticipate then being able to have a process in place for the next phase? Once you've done the identification, end of you know January sometime? Yes. When do you anticipate you'll be able to start the next phase of the process? Well, I mean, as I mentioned, Senator, that phase is dependent on being able to identify the cohort, so it would yeah, have to I be at understand. least post that phase. Yeah, I understand and that. And in, in the meantime, while we are going through that work, we are also doing this body of work to look at what would be appropriate processes, recognising the complexity of these yeah, different groups. So um, again, we would anticipate that it would be some time after the identification process has finished early in the new year, but there are also some decisions to be made along the way, which can only be made once we know the shape of the cohort. So the shape of the cohort will affect the, the time that it would take to do various options that might be available to us and the cost of those options. So they obviously come with some decisions for government. So then let's go on to the issue of cost. What, in terms of... Um, what are the cost areas that you've already identified and what are those costs? Um, so, Senator, as I've explained, because we're working through the identification of the cohort, it's very tricky for us to know what the co and, and what a new process might look like. It's very tricky for us to know what the costs of that might be. I can tell you that we're working closely with the Department of Social Services and the Department of Finance that we will need to review the costs of the program and the forward estimates on the program as a result of these changes. Um, but we're just not in a position to say what they're likely to be until we know how many people are affected and we know what we're going to do as next steps with that group. What are the cost centres, Dr Baxter, that you're considering? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. So, um, costs in terms in of yeah. human resources within the department. You've got 750 people working on it now. Is that one of the costs that you're going to count? Well, the, the costs of the program are a matter of public record and they've also been provided to this inquiry. Um, you would understand that the, the aspects of those costs are, are largely around the, the people who are working on the program. Um, that is the, that's the most significant cost, but time, of course, impacts that. So the relative time that any particular process that we might use to work through next steps with this group will be something that will impact the costs. So the, the provision, the staffing allocation will be a significant cost yes. to go back and do everything manually now Well, staffing in response and to the automated process that drove the problem. So the process now and the costs of the program now are highly driven by the cost of our staff. And because that's an as unknown I mentioned earlier, while um, you know, while there has been a lot of discussion about this in the, in the community and in the media, 
Um, it is a highly manual process that does involve a lot of staff, even the way it has existed prior to this change. So yes, staff chair, is our biggest driver just to, to of to reconfirm, Dr Baxter, in your opening statement, you did actually talk about the fact that at every stage of the process, throughout every stage <coughs> of this, there has been absolutely manual involvement by staff as That's opposed good. to this uh, imagined process of robots that there has been the who, the assistance, the calculation, the recovery, the review, We're the appeal has actually been done by real people <coughs> at every stage of the process. So that's, this that's current good. process is still being done by real people. We're not actually now well, that's reinventing the wheel. Going forward, Excuse me, on, Senator O'Neill. You've had quite a lot to say today. Right, and I so I would just like to clarify of the something. Who've been I think it's about time notices, someone else got deserve. something to say. Federal Hang government on. that didn't seek Stop proper Stop both of you, please. You've had quite a good reign, De Senator O'Neill, if you wouldn't mind me having a little go here. Just to clarify, as you said in your opening statement, there's been a manual process at every stage of the way this entire time. That's what's called. Through the who, the assistance, the calculation, the recovery, the review and the appeal. So the current process that's now being undertaken is in the same way involving the manual use of people being involved in this process. This is not a new part, this is not a new thing, this is not in, you know, reinventing the wheel. There has always been a manual process to this as opposed to the invention of the robo term. That's correct. Thank you, Dr Baxter. Um, just for everybody's uh, information, I intend going for a very short break at 11 um, so people can have uh, visit the conveniences, um, et cetera. Um, so where there's, I've got, I was trying to establish what the current process is. It's taken us some time to do that. Um, I do want to, so we may continue, obviously things are gonna come out while we yeah, continue to ask yeah. some questions. Um, I do want to ask in terms of, you've already, we've already established that current processes have been frozen in terms of the approach to income um, averaging. That's correct. That's correct. Yep. Well, what about in terms of flagging to the ATO, garnishing? Uh, so we're what, flagging. What is your question? Is so is in terms of debts that may have been um, calculated via income averaging, where flags have been uh, already articulated to the ATO, are they being pulled back? Yes, so cases are no longer being referred to the ATO for garnishing. What about cases that have been referred? Of the, um, sorry, for this financial year, there's 66,000 have been garnished. So from the 1st of July to the 31st of October, that's right, isn't it? Yes, 66,000, yes. total of 72 million, have had tax, uh, 666, Look, look, 66,000 Australians have had their tax return garnished. How, how many of those have been income managed? Uh, sorry, income managed. Sorry, I've got that in the brain. I'm income averaged. So our process of identification will work through how many of those have had income averaging used as the sole basis of a debt in some part of their review. Um, so I can't tell you at this stage how many of those have been income average, but they, as I understood the evidence of the ATO previously, are garnishings that are complete, so they have been done. What I'm saying yes, to you today is, is once we made this decision, we were no longer referring cases to the ATO for garnishing. And what date did you stop doing that, Dr Baxter? I'd have to take the date on notice, but it was very shortly after the decision was okay. made. So those, the ATO will still have some on hand? Um, the evidence I understood from the ATO this morning was that once they are referred, that process happens quite quickly. Um, Mr Seaback might be able to provide some more information about how that part of things works for us. But there will be a category of cases where they've previously been referred for garnishing, That's they've right. been garnished, and then there will be some that post this decision, um, we have discontinued Sorry. the practice of I, referring I, this group to the ATO that, while we're identifying them. But my understanding is some could have previously been flagged, they haven't put their tax return in yet, so I'm not talking about, you know, um, future. the future, I'm talking about now, what's flagged on the system that hasn't yet been addressed, because my understanding is a two-step process, you flag it, ATO has it there, when the person then puts in their return, they come back to you. Mr Seaback's in the best position to talk through that process for us. Thank you, Dr Baxter. 
And I think I've explained that in one of the answers to the questions from the October hearing too, where I've sort of outlined the process a little bit. So There wasn't a lot of information in the answers we got back and fed you. In fact, you told us you couldn't tell us a lot of information, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, okay, so in this context, and the number you refer to in terms of um, Garner She Action refer to the whole social welfare debt program, not just the income compliance, so they're a subset. You are correct um, that there would be a number of, of debts um, that have been flagged with the ATO um, for refund action to occur, and obviously they would come back to us before that occurred to make sure that the debt is still valid. Um, and of that, there would be a proportion that would be related to the income compliance program. Um, and as Dr Baxter said, uh, once we identify those debts uh, that were unilaterally averaged, um, we would then isolate those and freeze debt recovery, which would include garnishing action also. So you don't know how many they're currently holding because they have to go through this other process? Correct, Senator. So if they come back to you then, if somebody now turns up from the, you know, from the start of the new process, if somebody comes up on their system as having been flagged, they come back to you. Yeah. What do you do? Then? What do you do then? Yeah. The garnishee action would occur automatically in that context. So, um, in other words, people who have still income have a debt related to income averaging right now that have been flagged through the system could still get garnished. Potentially, yes. Why can't you then go back to that particular one? We'll go back to anything that comes back from the ATO now to identify them straight up so they don't get the stress of getting their tax Money return taken. garnished. But in the context of the process, debt recovery continues largely until you're identified as being in the cohort mm. and then debt is frozen, debt recovery is frozen. But, that, but that's nonsensical. We're going to take your money You first. already know that there's potentially, and you know, like it's potentially unlawful. We've certainly already had a case that's unlawful and I've read the finding and it's pretty scathing. Yeah. And yet they can still, a person who has had their debt calculated through income averaging, which you say are frozen, can still get their tax return garnished. Until they're identified as being in the code. But why can't you go straight away, since the tax department, uh, ATO, comes to you and says, should we go we've ahead? had a flag, should yep. we go ahead? because they have not yet been identified as being in the code. But that case is right there. You can pull up Joe Bloggs and go, oh, income averaged. No, don't garnish. The approach is to continue debt recovery. Why? Until they're identified as being Why? in the cohort. That is the approach. Because the but system's the, more important than the people. No, is that it, what's going on here? Hang on, hang on. Seriously. Hang on, hang on. You said we've been Goodness. told there is a human based approach now. Surely a human can get a piece of paper or a file and look at it and say, this is based on income averaging, do not garnish this tax return. Well, isn't that what you're doing, so if I can just, if I can just take a, a step back. So there, there are two separate processes that we're taking here. One is for um, uh, the process where we are identifying people as being in scope, as having had some um, income averaging in their process. If we are responsible for their debt recovery, we are freezing that as people are identified. Um, and that's a decision that government has made that will freeze recovery of debt as people are identified. For referrals that are going, that would otherwise go to the tax office, those who are involved in the um, online income compliance system, we are not referring those anymore to the yep. tax office while yeah, we're I'm, working I'm through aware, identification. I'm aware of the cohort so, that we're talking so about. That is, that is how it's working. So it is, a, it is a broader group that we are not referring through to the tax office for garnishing. I get that. I'm talking about the group that have already been referred. Yes. Some of those, from what I can... You know, we don't know how many, but some of those may well have been income managed. They haven't been processed yet because they haven't put in a tax return. Yeah. So why can't they, if they, the tax department comes back to you, this is I think the third time I've asked this, comes back to you and says, you flagged this person, Joe Bloggs, as having to, um, a potential debt. Do you want us to go ahead? because it's a two-step process. Why can't you just 
look at that file and go, no, it involves income averaging. And I think Mr Seaback has explained how that process is working. So that goes it, to the letter, Senator Sewer, that says all other debt raising and recovery will continue business as usual. Is this what business as usual looks like? ATO will still garnish you people. I, I don't understand why this is a two-step process if, is, is if you don't do some sort of checking process before the tax return is garnished. Why bother having the ATO come back to you if you just say, yes, go ahead? without checking? Well, in that context, to ensure there is still a, a debt there to, to garnish, for the garnishy action to occur. But, but if you're checking that debt, why can't you now go back with all these humans that you're saying you've got to do this to check to see if it's income average debt? Well, I honestly don't get it. There's no pause button on the process. It's keep, keep sending out the debt and recovering the debt. That's what it looks like to us, Mr Seabag. You know, like you're here as a public servant. And I'm sure you're trying to do the best thing in your job. I'm just trying to understand why Australians who, who are going to put in their tax return are going to pay a debt that has been described in the federal court as one that was a demand for payment from the federal government that was not validly made. In light of that new information, so there I should be a change of process mm -hmm. in favour of the Australian people not in favour of the government's balance sheet. So, Senator, what I can tell you is that a decision's been made that we will pause recovery as people are identified as actually being in scope. And there's a now, moment of identification. Hang on, hang on, let Dr Baxter finish. Oh, it's the same process over so, and over. So we, are, we will pause recovery as, as they're being identified as in scope. Some of the queries that were raised, I think, over this side earlier around um, you know, would somebody be confused if they had their recovery paused and they were potentially in scope? Then they found out they were not in scope and they had it reinstated a couple of weeks later. Were part of the, the thinking about how do we make sure we identify these cases as quickly as possible and how do we make sure that when someone has their recovery frozen, they can be certain that there's somebody who is in scope for this change. So what we have undertaken to do is pause recovery of those elements that we have control over as soon as we identify these people. We've undertaken to not refer new cases for garnishing um, to the ATO if this is somebody who's caught up in this part of the online income compliance program. Yep. But as Mr Seabax pointed out, there are some processes um, that are still underway where the tax office may come back to us where it won't be as simple as that, but not all of those why, cases why won't will be ones that have been averaged. And of those mm. that have been averaged, they won't all be ones which, even if we went back and determined them not on the basis of averaging, would not necessarily have a debt. Yes. So we can, we can take yeah, on board the, uh, yeah, the suggestion that. that you've made this morning, that we should have a look at is there some process we can do when those debts then come back to us for checking to ensure that if we are aware that people are um, in scope, that that's then not flagged for that final part of the process. We can take that on board. Um, but that is the way the process stands at the moment. Business as usual. How many... Um that's what it says. Referrals will come back from the tax office every month or on a weekly basis. How does it come through to you? Just add it as a... I'd have to take that on notice, Senator, but what I can say is that ordinarily most of the Garner She action, or at least two thirds of the Garner She action in relation to tax funds occurs in the first three months of the financial year. Yeah. So in, this, in the context of this financial year, uh, the vast majority of Garner She action has already occurred. Well, two thirds of it. Two thirds. Can, so, are you able to tell us how many have been referred for this financial year? I might. So we can work out. You know, I, I appreciate what you've said. Two thirds of it, which make it makes sense. But how many have been flagged? Oh, I'll have to take that one on notice. Sorry, Senator. I only have um, number of debts already garnished and, and the value of that. That would be... Well, that's what that's, we've got. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the 66 yeah. and yeah. 72 million. And, and just to clarify something you said earlier when you were talking about answers to questions on notice, you can't break that down further then, can you? That's all Centrelink garnishes, isn't it? It is correct. For all debts. All social welfare. All social welfare related debts. Sorry? It's all, all social welfare debts. Yes, that's what I that's what I sorry, that's what I I meant, sorry. Can you break clear. that down into robo debt, disability support pension, youth allowance, new start, child support, any other so categories? Your, your, your reference to 
robo debt. I mean, we've I think we've answered in response to many questions from this inquiry and through estimates that we are not able to um, identify which particular cases have used this averaging, and that's why we're going through this identification process at the moment. So. Mr Seaback would be no more able to identify those cases within his remit that have been calculated solely on the basis of averaging than we are able to for the cohort as a and whole. No, we are working through that process. I appreciate that. It was what I was looking for was how much of the, is the online process. Oh, right. is My understanding from the answers that we got previously is you, you mm -hmm. couldn't break that down. Is that That's correct? correct. And it's not I mean, it's, it's more by reference to, I guess, payment type and those sort of things rather than the program that gave rise to the debt. So, so it's, As sorry, I, I, I'm not yeah. following what you've just said, yeah. sorry. So in the context of trying to work through that, um, it may be more, it, it might be, e it's easier for us to do it by reference to payment type debt. Which is what to, Senator But not, not program. So the income compliance not a payment type, it's just a program that operates to find anomalies across yes. multiple. So mm -hmm. it would be much more difficult, um, and I'm not sure possible, to be able to show where garnishy action occurred um, in response to income compliance versus So you could give us a garnishy detail, but not according to that structure. There, there is a structure that you could provide more more um, fine-tuned data about gunnishy action from yes. the DHS. What, what would the category What I'm saying, uh, but it would be by reference to, to payment type, so where, where the debt arose in the context of the payment so type. Pay, payment type is new start. Yeah, great, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay. So could, could we get can that? We get that? I'll take that on now. Thank okay. you. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. So um, you, you said that you're garnishing from payments that come from DHS, so if somebody's got a debt, you're taking the money out of their fortnightly allowance that's coming, but the other source of garnishing is the ATO. What Sorry, else? Sorry, just to clarify, it's not it's not garnishing when we're taking material from, when your taking own. from their um, fortnightly yeah. payment. That's a payment arrangement that we have in place with people. I okay. think the term it's we use is with, uh, withholding. withholding. All right, so could you, could you talk me through the different forms of withholding or recovery of funds? so I'm clear about what you do and what the ATO does. Well, in that context, the only thing the ATO does is facilitate the garnishee of a tax refund on our behalf. Great, okay. So that's the only thing the ATO mm -hmm. does and that, on our behalf in the context of debt recovery. Okay, and they, the ones with the flags we've just been discussing, what else do you do in terms of debt recovery? Or um, Let me just go through a few... Payment plans. Uh, well... Withholding. Payment... Withholding. Withholding. So there are a number of number of things we do, and often we split that between current customers and, and former customers of the organisation. So the department will, will withhold automatically a percentage of customers' payment or allowance if they do not negotiate an alternative withholding rate payment arrangement before the debt's due. And what's that percentage as a standard? It varies between um, um, payment types. I think the standard for, I think it's, I'll, I'll come back to you a little bit later, but I've, I've got you. that somewhere. Yep. Um, a customer can negotiate an alternative withholding rate, which takes account of their individual circumstances, and yep. that often happens. The department um, does not refer current customers repaying a debt via withholdings to external collection agents. In terms of former customers, um, those who are no longer in receipt of a social welfare payment, and who do not have a suitable payment arrangement in place, the department will attend to contact and negotiate, contact the individual to negotiate a suitable payment arrangement. And the department no negotiates these on, with former customers' circumstances and capacity to repay taken into account. The department will explore further recovery action where contact attempts are unsuccessful or the former customer refuses to enter into a suitable repayment arrangement. And that further recovery action relates to the resources available to the department to re recover a debt without the customer's consent. And these activities include the application of an interest charge, the garnishee of tax refunds, wages and bank accounts, referral to an external Sorry, collection Sorry, you're agent. going quite Sorry. quickly. Sorry. So no, no repayment leads referral to potentially a debt collector 
or to... So there are a range of options. Yep. Um, application of an interest charge. Yes. The garnishee action in relation to a tax refund, wages or bank accounts. Yep. Referral to an ECA. Which is a collection agent. Yep. The potential to issue a departure prohibition order. Sorry, I don't even, I've never you even can't heard of that leave the country. Oh, okay. Similar to, um, and, and commonly used in the child support context. Yep. How many, can you take, do you know how many of those have been? Or maybe take, maybe come back to that. Uh, Keep going through your list. I'll just yeah. write a note can of the ones I'm coming yeah. back to you on. Yeah. And just bearing again in mind that none of those can Mr Seaback break down for this program. He might better break some of it down by type, but not for this program, by but payment. There type. is also civil recovery action through the courts as well. Okay. And, and in that context, um, um, civil recovery action follows a formal process, issue of a letter of demand, obtaining a judgment order for the value of the debt, and enforcement of the judgment order through the seizure and sale of assets. And perhaps just to put it in context, and I think I flagged this at the last hearing, is that many of these are options of last resort. Mm -hmm. And so in the context, and you already have the figures around the garnishee of, of tax refunds, yep. but perhaps just a few figures just to put it in context around bank garnishee and wage garnishee. So in 2016-17, um, in terms of bank garnishee, only 180 debts to the value of 0.7 million. Wage garnishee, 2,668 debts to the value of 3.6 million. 1718, 291 debts for bank garnishee, recovered 2.4 million roughly. These are just sort of estimates on the rounding of the, the dollar figures. Wage garnishee for 1718, 2008. 2.6 million. And for 2018-19, bank garnishee 305 debts to the value of 2.07 million and wage garnishee 2,224 debts to the value of 3.92 million, which I think shows that we, we only, only utilise those more, um, I guess, um, um, significant powers um, um, as a last resort Thank and you. conservatively. Hmm. Thank you. Um, just one if I can on debt recovery practices, seeing as we're there. I'm sure you're aware of an article by Catherine Murphy in The Guardian with regard to the um, Office of um, Information, the Information Commissioner, about private information being handed improperly to debt collectors under the robo debt scheme. You may want to give us a copy of that article. Okay. That's all I've got. Um, so, would you be able to provide some detail about? Well. That? In that context, I'll say up front that the department treats the protection of personal information extremely seriously. As Dr Baxter mentioned earlier in our opening statement, we've been using ECAs to recover certain social welfare debts since 1996, and they make up an important um, element of our debt management strategy. And just in the context of that, um, over, I would suggest, if I can recall, the last, at least the last eight years, uh, their contribution to debt recovery has been um, less than 10% of all debt recovered. So just um, to put in the context that um, that element of it. And what's the quantum of that, Mr Siebert? Um I can provide that um, just quickly, if you bear with me, two seconds. So in 2014-15, and I'll just round these out. ECAs contributed 131 million to debt recovered that year, about 9% of all debt recovered. In 15 16, about 144 million, which equated to about 9.4% of all debt recovered. In 2016 17, 126 million, uh, which equated to 7.7% of all debt recovered. In 17 18, 125 million, 7.4 per cent of all debt recovered, and in 1819, 147 million, 7.9 per cent of all debt recovered. And just recognising again, that is all social welfare debt, not, not the not ones just, we're talking about yeah. here. Okay. And if I can just go back to um, the comment you made about um, the, um, the article in the Guardian, 
We have not received any information about matters raised with the Australian Information Commissioner. As we've said before, the department no longer raises debts where the only information we're relying on is our averaging of Australian Taxation Office data. We are identifying online compliance reviews affected by this change and will freeze recovery of these debts. Um, and that includes, um, and I think in this context, similar to the um, referral um, or ceasing the referral of relevant cases to, external, um, to um, the ATO for garnishing action, we've also stopped the referral of, um, of cases to external collection agents. Okay. So that begs the same question that I was asking for. And it would be the same answer. Business so you haven't, usual. Recall, business, you haven't so recalled one you've already given out? So only where we have identified them as being within the target cohort, and then we do recall them as part of freezing debt recovery. So, so we've, we've blanketly, for cases that are within this part of the online income compliance program, we're no longer referring to the ATO, yes, we're I no longer yes, referring yeah, to yeah, ECAs, no, I get that. Yep. and as people are identified yeah. as being in scope, we will recall them but not blanketly recalling all of those that are in the online income so, same. Program. So the same question in terms of yes, the number the, of garnishees that are out this there with the... Um, external collection agents. With the, ex with the tax department, can you... Uh, ATO, sorry. Can you tell me how many then are out there currently with external collection we'll agents? We'll take that on notice. Okay. Now, I did say we are going to break at 11. I know Senator Askew has... I only have one question. You have a clarification, I just wanted to clarify question. the referral of flags to the ATO. I just wanted to understand how many and how often they were, you know, roughly being done. So is it once a year that you do it? Is it every month? How often do you send a list off? I'll, I'll take that one on notice. It's just I, I have it in the yeah. back of my mind, but I just want to be certain. So when I... you do that, could you sort of how often it's done and, and the numbers that are flagged, mm -hmm. like on that basis, and then also what percentage is then recovered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then what's that pro what process? Do they call the recovery? Sorry. Identification? No, no. When you re, um, do the clean up process at the end. Reconciliation. Re no, uh, no, no, it was a tune up. Up. Tune was up. It tune no, up. That was actually yeah. from DS, DHS to them, I think, is what he said. True up. 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 True a true up is not a tune up? No. No, yeah. I mean, true I think up. the time period they were talking about was the yeah. commencement of the new financial year. They may have been talking about the family tax benefit process yeah, okay. with the annual reconciliation to that. Right. But I couldn't be certain that's their term for that. Okay, okay. we'll clarify that. We'll clarify that. Okay, so <coughs> let's come back. I'll give you an extra minute at 10 past 11. Excellent. Okay.
Thank you. Now, clarifying questions. Yes. So the first one is, um, there's a group of people who received a debt notice uh, generated in the same way as Ms Amato's, which was found to be not validly made, who also, apart from uh, the income averaging, probably provided some pay slips, incomplete information, um, because they didn't have comprehensive em employment information. What, what's, what's happening with that group? So, um, Senator, I think I stepped you through before all of the people that we are identifying as part of this process of identifying and the cohort. And my question is, in that and it cohort, will include, no, 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 so let me mention. go yeah. to it. So it will include people who all we have is income average data. It will include people where some component of their debt was worked out on the basis of income average data. So perhaps they've got a debt that includes number of employers and we only income average for one employer, we would pick those up in it. So where there is any element where a component or a year or an employer of the debt has been calculated solely on the basis of income averaging, we have made sure that our process can pick that person up, count that case, include that in this cohort. So be assured they will all be included in this identification and thought about as we think about what are the next steps. Yeah, because I think a lot of people would have had incomplete information, so that, that, that's important for them to know that. The other thing is um, two questions about communications and requests for copies of communications in any form between DHS and the ATO with regard to changes of practice arising if you so, could. so I've indicated to you that we communicated the change in practice to the ATO. That was a communication from me to the relevant deputy secretary. Do we have of the a copy ATO. of that? Oh, I don't have it with me. Could you provide that on notice? Uh, on notice, sure. And are yeah. there any other communications? Any any other formal meetings or briefings? Um, there certainly have been directions, telephone calls in relation to that, and then the communication about our expectation of the practice that we would no longer be referring those cases. So, if you could provide on notice all communications and summaries of conversations, etc., that would be helpful. Um, the other thing is the information commissioner. Um, Mr Seabeck, you gave partial answer. My question is, have you had any formal communication either generated by your, initiated by yourself or the um, information commissioner with regard to concern about privacy and the sharing of information Senator, with debt collectors? Senator, we're not aware of anything. I'll take on notice to check, you know, has anything come in since my awareness, but we're not aware of anything today. From Are you aware of the article that I yes. referred to? Yes. And what was your response to that article? Did you um, do anything? So, as as always, when, when, when I or our officers become aware of these things, we check our process to ensure that it's robust with regards to privacy. The department takes people's privacy very, very seriously. Um, so we looked at our processes to ensure they are robust and also to check whether we had received any notifications from the Information Commissioner, which we had not at that stage. But I will take on notice in case we've received any in the meantime. I'm not aware of any. Was it serious Seabat? enough for you to write to the Office of the, com the Commissioner? No, uh, I didn't write to the Office of the Information Commissioner. We I, I investigated our processes and was assured that our processes were appropriate with regards to people's private information. So, Dr Baxter, I appreciate the fullness of your answer, but given the failings of DHS, I, I don't know that the Australian people have confidence in your processes anymore. Can I encourage you to write to the Information Commissioner on behalf of people who have these concerns, find out the detail of what's going on? Um, thank you. We'll take that on notice. Thanks. Okay, what I wanted to go to now is uh, legal, the legal side of this and legal advice that uh, various departments have sought. Um, how, how many times has either DHS or the Department of Social <laughs> Services sought legal advice on the legality of the online compliance process? Um, Senator, you would be aware that this is a, a large and complex program which has had several iterations. Um, we have had from time to time advice that relates to various aspects of the program. Um, I can assure you and the committee that the department has always acted in good faith and our best understanding of the law at the time. Um, and, but but I, I certainly don't have an answer as to how many times legal advice has been sought. You take that on notice, please. How many times the legal 
advice has um, been sought and when was the last <coughs> can you answer when was the last time so legal senator advice I'm, was I'm sure you understand we do have federal court litigation on <coughs> foot at the moment in relation to these matters um, we also have a, a very well publicised class action um, that we're undertaking, which goes in part to issues of, of good faith and you know, absence or presence of negligence. In that context, um, it's not appropriate for me to take questions about the nature of the legal advice we received. I, did, I didn't ask you about the it, nature. The, the timing of it or what we did with it. So um, I don't see why you can't ask, answer how many times you've sought legal advice or when was the last time you sought legal advice. Um, I think what I've indicated to you, Senator, is that the class action, that the, the federal court um, matter that's on foot, but in particular the class action, absolutely goes to matters of how the department acted, its understanding of the law at the time, um, it, the, the timing of any legal advice, whether or not negligence was present, did we act in good faith? And for that reason, I think that any questions that go to the timing of legal advice, the amount of legal advice, issues we may have sought legal advice on are probably appropriately matters for the subject of a public interest immunity claim. So I would need to take any of those questions on notice to discuss with the Minister. Are you claiming public interest immunity, Dr Baxter? Um, I'm not, I, what I'm saying to you is that I think they are matters which are appropriately the subject of a public interest immunity claim and I would need to take them on notice and discuss with the Minister whether he would be prepared to make a public interest immunity claim in that regard. So that sounds like you are quite a cover up. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is we're that having trouble getting information today. Yeah. It is it is usual practice that where we receive legal advice, particularly where we have active litigation on foot. In this case, we not only have active federal court litigation, but we also have a class matter that goes to the heart of what did the department know, understand, on what basis did it act. Um, that is absolutely on the public record as mm -hmm. being what the class action is about. Mm -hmm. In that context, these are very appropriately matters that would form the basis of a public interest immunity claim, but I would need to take that question on notice in order to discuss such a claim with the Minister. So, to be clear, you, are you or are you not making a public interest immunity claim in response to the questions? To be very clear, today? what I am saying is that I will take the question on notice so that I can discuss with the Minister whether he may make a public interest immunity claim in relation to those matters. But I, I feel they are absolutely appropriate matters for the subject of a public interest immunity claim. I've got questions, so I'm going to put them on the record. Hopefully, I live in hope. Um, during the most recent estimates hearing, Services Australia representatives could not provide an adequate answer about the legal basis for the scheme the robo-debt scheme, with uh, Secretary Rene, Rene Leon submitting that it did not require specific legislation. On Wednesday the 27th of November, the Federal Court handed down a decision that revealed the government had accepted that there was no legal basis for plaintiff Diana Amato's debt to be raised and tax return garnished and for the 10 per cent penalty be arrived, to, to be applied. Has Services to Australia got a different answer to the question of legality today? Was robo-debt suspended after the department double-checked and found that it did need a section in the Act to use income averaging and the practical reverse onus of proof? Well, there are so many pieces to that. I'll start with um, you, the, the, the question, question of legality. About, the question about was this change made because of legal advice that we have had. Um, I've explained to you that what we are doing here is we have been through an iterative process of working through the program. There have been three iterations of the program to date. We've continued to work with customers, staff, third party, ombudsman's office. We've listened to evidence before this inquiry and we continue to listen to the evidence given here. The work that we've done to date has very much focused on how do we improve engagement with our customers and that's been through things that I know have been explored with this committee in some depth like the um, work we've done on introducing registered mail, um, some work we've done earlier this year about how do we increase our contacts with customers to improve that engagement. So the change that we've made to the program is in response to that ongoing program of iteration, listening, working with customers, working with staff, working with organisations, rather than in response to a particular legal matter. So Dr um, Baxter, to be clear, you're saying that the legal matter that I referred to 
has not impacted your change of practices, that that was a natural iterative response that you've now pulled 750 people off what they were doing and onto this, and it's got nothing to do with the legal case of Ms Amato. Um, what I'm saying, Senator, is that we have been engaged in an ongoing program of yes, work. Yes, I, I know, I heard what you said, but you're I, saying I it's got nothing quite, to do with the I'm legal thing. Finished. Well, so we Ms. Have, Ms. Ms. Ba Dr Baxter, I appreciate the fullness of your answers, but you're answering questions that you want to ask yourself. My question is, are you absolutely, are you seriously telling me that your decision of change of practice that we've been discussing for some hours this morning and pulling 750 people, half of your workforce, off what they were doing to clean up the mess of robo-debt had nothing to do with any legal matters? Is it, I, I find that hard to believe. Is that what you're telling me? So what I am telling you is that our work to increase engagement with customers, including looking at how can we have less reliance on income averaging, absolutely predates the current litigation. Of course, as we're involved in processes of reviewing our processes, ensuring they're as robust as they can possibly be, we take into account litigation we may be involved in at the time. But what I can tell you is that body of work to improve our engagement with customers, to make this the best, most responsive program we can, has predated and coincided with litigation that we may have been involved in. It is Dr. by Dr. no Stone. means a single or deciding factor. Yes, the gremlin disturbing system. <laughs> but um, somebody's listening. Oh. Dr Baxter, um, I appreciate the, you know, the way that you're playing the game here today and your um, you know, robust defence of robo-debt. But we've sat in this room with you, and I've been on phone calls with the department, where income averaging, just a matter of weeks ago, was still being robustly defended by your department. So I find it hard to believe that the change of the scale that we've been discussing this morning is not driven by the court case. So I'll ask again, have you got a different answer to the question of legality that was asked of a sec uh, Secretary Renee Leon saying that it did not require specific legislation in an act to use income averaging in the practical reverse onus of proof. And Senator, what I can tell you is that compliance activity is not unlawful. The program, our best understanding of the legal position is that the program is not unlawful and that the department has acted at all times in good faith and on our best understanding of the legal position at the time. So the minister refused to provide any legal advice about the scheme Will the department confirm that there was advice provided? Um, so I think, Senator, I've already told you that in a large and complex program like this that's had a number of iterations, there has been legal advice about various aspects of the program over time. So was there legal advice provided at the commencement of the OCI phase? Was there what? I'm sorry. Was legal advice provided at the commencement of the um, OCI phase? The first phase? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the only detail I'm able to provide you there, Senator, is to say that we, we have had legal advice from time to time and that any specific um, questions you may want to ask us about did we get advice at a particular instance in response to a particular part of the program, what did that advice go to or what was the timing of that advice, um, that reflects the answer I gave a moment ago where I said I think given the class action we have on foot, these are matters that properly go to the subject of a public interest immunity claim, and I would need to take that on notice and discuss that with the minister. But this is a very significant change of practice for the DHS before it commenced. I'm not asking about during the process yet, but at the beginning of a very significant change, is it standard practice for the department to seek legal advice to determine if the action you're about to take is actually legal or not? So the department will assure itself from time to time, particularly if it is entering a new program, that it's confident that the program is lawful and that it's acting on the best understanding of the legal position at the time. That, that would be usual practice, yes. So did you take advice at the commencement of the OCI? So I've already indicated to you, that Senator, you're not going to that answer that question. I won't be answering questions that go to specifically, did we get legal advice at a particular time, the content of that advice, the source of that advice, because that does go to issues that have been raised through the class action about what we understood, why we took particular decisions we did, and issues that have been raised of negligence or absence of negligence. And um, I think I've given you as much as I can, which is okay, that the I'm still going to ask my questions because I want you to 
determinedly determined not to answer them. So did you take any advice at any point throughout the scheme's operation and refinement? So I've already answered that question, Senator. I've told you You may that. or may not, but you're not going to tell us. Well, no, I've told you that in a program that's as large and complex as this one and has had several iterations, yes, we have had legal advice on various aspects of the program from time to time. But you just don't won't tell me, well, did you take advice immediately following the Victoria Legal Aid submission to the federal court? So it would be normal practice that we are engaged in discussions with our legal advisers, both in internal and external, around litigation. That, that so is there a would be a trigger, would assume, that would mean that you took advice. Uh, what about um, after the department received the letter sent by Gordon Legal indicating the firm was proceeding with class action? Did you take advice then? So in relation to any litigation, it is a normal process that we work with our legal advisers. So. That's a bit different from I'm not telling you anything to, yes, we have been taking legal advice all the way through no, that, the process. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to you it is standard practice that where we have litigation on foot, that our legal officers are responsible for assisting us in running that litigation and we would be working with them. Right. I'm not talking to you about any specific advice that we may or may not have taken in relation to this case, other cases, the program as a whole, because I've indicated to you that there is litigation on foot currently now that goes precisely to those matters and therefore, as is standard practice across the Commonwealth, long-standing standard practice, these are matters which are properly the subject of a public interest immunity claim and I would like to take those questions on notice so I can discuss such a claim with my minister. So what we've discerned is the detail you will take on notice, but in general, it is the practice of DHS to take legal advice, particularly when legal matters arise. No, so what I'm saying to you that is it is done. standard practice yep. across the department and the government that lawyers run legal proceedings. And so if we are engaged in legal proceedings, of course we would be um, working with our lawyers on those proceedings. But you're not willing to talk to us about that? No, not at all. Thanks. Okay. Um, I did want, do you have any no, further right. legal? I wanted to, employment, you've been sitting there very <laughs> calmly. Um, I know Senator O'Neill has questions, as do I. What I'm keen to understand um, is, let me go to my bits of paper, um, around the issues around vulnerabilities. I, have, I still have confusion in my mind about how we deal with people with vulnerabilities, whether they've had, well, we know that they've actually had uh, debt notices, and I'm keen to understand which cohort of people with vulnerabilities have these notices and how they got them. Can we, can I please ask you, Miss Pitt or Miss Jensen, sorry if I'm asking the wrong person, and that is, can we clarify how the department uh, addresses vulnerabilities, and then I want to ask how the Department of Social Services um, addresses vulnerabilities. Okay, so Ms. Pitt. Okay, in terms of um, vulnerabilities, in terms of employment services, are identified and addressed in a number of different ways. So, um, in terms of the vulnerability indicators, they're actually applied by DHS. Um, so, um, my colleagues might be able to, to respond to, to that more. But in terms of employment services, if somebody, uh, if an employment service provider, um, when they're you know, working with somebody, especially for the first time, if they have a vulnerability indicator applied, or if vulnerability is indicated in some other way through the job seeker classification instrument, or in conversation um, with their employment service provider about their personal circumstances, then, then those are things that are taken into account in working through and developing an individual job plan. Okay. Do you take in, so can I then go to DHS? If some, if say a job service provider, oh, sorry, as I'm saying that the TCF is running through my brain and how those vulnerabilities are flagged, but just say, so, ignore that for a minute, somebody turns up um, at their job service provider, they're streamed yes, into the job seeker classification C, through the job seeker cl classification. That process, does it take into account any vulnerabilities that have already been flagged with DHS? 
Well, in terms of the job seeker classification instrument, so that's a series of questions that are asked, and so that's dependent on the job seeker disclosing information. But there's certainly, um, so that, that kind of goes to people's, um, you know, education, the, the labour market they're in, um, indigeneity, um, uh, transport. So there's, there's, that's the kinds of issues that are, that are captured in the job seeker classification instrument that may, and so as a result of that, the people will get streamed into, into one of the three servicing streams. So if somebody through that process is, uh, is streamed into stream B or to stream C, that would indicate that that's a person who's got you know, some, some issues or some that, that need to be considered in, in terms of ongoing um, support. So if I've already got flagged that I have a psychological or psychiatric um, condition, yep. how's that addressed if I've already got that flagged? So if that's, if that's been flagged as a vulnerability indicator that, that the employment service provider can see on the system. so. Um, in terms of how an employment service provider might respond to that. So they, they, they might be able to ask, you know, questions about, um, you know, what their current state is and what their, their, you know, are they on medication or how that's affecting them. So people who, at that point, because of their, their psychiatric impairment or mental illness, aren't in a position to, to actively participate in employment services, they, those people then might have, get a medical exemption um, from their mutual obligations for a period and, of time. And so you provide, how do you then make sure that they get that? Or, so, or get an assessment for that? So, so often that, that assessment would happen before they, they come to the employment service providers, but if it's not, then the employment service providers can explain to that job seeker that they can, they may be able to um, be eligible for a medical exemption depending if they can get a doctor's certificate that they then um, provide to DHS. So if anything's flagged in terms of then it turning up on their record, they have to go back to DHS for a vulnerability it, it, indicator. It depends what the vulnerability indicator See, is. See, this is, you can understand why people are confused because do you do it or, the, or does DHS do it? So I guess it's a combination. In terms of the vulnerability indicator, that's applied by DHS. In no. terms of other issues that might be identified, either through the job seeker classification instrument, <coughs> through the employment services assessment, through just day-to-day -day interaction with the job seeker. So if, if other issues are identified at that point, then, then appropriate advice and action can be taken. So the vulnerability indicators are one um, indicator for the people, but they're not the only indicator that, that people Somebody have Somebody needs issues. to go into A, B or C. Yeah. But if, but if there's any that then are indicated they, to go on their record, yep. has to go back to DHS? Well, DHS apply the vulnerability mm -hmm. indicators yes. and then and DHS also manage um, medical exemptions. Okay. So can I go to DHS then? And of the vulnerability indicators, and I've got the answer to... Um, the question 867 from the 27th of September, where we've got a list of um, recorded, first recorded medical conditions categories with a partial capacity to work. These are all applied by DHS, is that correct? So I'm sorry, which ones are you referring to? Um, I've got an answer to a question, sorry. Actually, it's from the Minister for Families and Social Services, which makes it even more confusing. Um, so that's in terms of a breakdown of different types of impairments, disabilities, people with a partial capacity to work have. Are they classed as vulnerability indicators? So it sounds like that's um, a question for my social services colleagues. It's their, it's their corn, I think. It, I, I suspect it is without having the benefit of it. Um, good morning, Senator. Good morning. Um, the, 
The discussion we had at that stage was to do with partial capacity to work. Yeah. And the, um, the concept of um, what makes someone vulnerable within the system and then how it might then relate to their capacity to work. Um, I think we potentially are crossing over different purposes um, because of the fact that, um, for example, vulnerable within the social security framework can include a number of different aspects, um, which may not necessarily be an equivalent subset or equation to partial capacity to work. Does that help? Yes and no, because it just makes it even more confusing. So when, if I'm flagged with a robo-debt, how, which vulnerability indicators are we using? The okay. ones that employment uses, the one that DHS uses, or the one that Department of Social Services uses for partial capacity to work? So if you're talking about how that interacts with the compliance, that's, that's Yeah, because I've, I've got another question here. It was question two, people with vulnerabilities to Services Australia from the 22nd of November, which, um, when I asked, sorry, I've got to go back up and check the question number. How many people with a vulnerability indicator have received an initial letter under the, um, the different, I asked it against the three different iterations, it said um, 9,149 recovery of 15, uh, the total of the debt was 15.4 million. Um, how many vulnerabilities had they had waived and, and what was the value of that? The point being is which vulnerability and which pro which process are we using? To identify to, vulnerability? Yeah. So, so, so oh, sorry. No, please. So in answering that question, Senator, we used the vulnerability indicator for the purposes of the job seeker participation, which has been the um, one that we've used in the program from inception to identify this particular group, although the, the, the group of vulnerable Australians is broader than the vulnerability indicator, and we I do know. exclude a wider range of cus customers from reviews. I can go through that list in a minute if you wish. In relation can, to can that answer- Can you take answer, that on notice because we're going to run out of time, so. So in, in relation to that answer, we've, we've had a close look at the, the what we've provided in the answer, and whilst the question asked about people, we actually answered it in terms of number of reviews. So the number of actually people is lesser, it's about 8,600. Of the 8,600, we've also identified somewhere around 1,100 reviews were cancelled within 24 hours of the review being initiated. How many? 1,100? About 1,100. Of the 8,000? Yeah, 8,600. 8,600, th sorry, 1,411. Sorry, can you start all that again? So of the 9,149 reviews which we answered the question, even though the question was phrased as people, and this goes to the heart of some of our In other data. words, some people had had more than one review, yeah. And some reviews have more than one debt. <laughs> so when we answer a question, we need to be careful. So we, we have 8,600 people. We cancelled 1,411 within 24 hours of that review being initiated. Um, this goes to the heart of our challenges that we've been having in the iterations of our system from OCI, EIC and QP, and how we have actually improved our exclusion of customers who are vulnerable through those processes. So of the remaining 7,200, 8,600 minus the 1,400, We've identified about a third of them were initiated through the online compliance, the OCI system, the pre-February 2017 system. How many were, sorry, sir? About a third, sir. Senator. Um, they were the OCI. They were OCI initiations, and the policy at the time of the OCI system was to initiate with a different letter. Um, it was a letter where we um, asked the customer to ring, not to go online, so we could resolve the review manually with the customer. So that was the OCI process. Then when we moved into the EIC system, early EIC, um, we started filtering out based on the vulnerability indicator, but our challenges were the timings of the different data sets, Senator. Mm. And so um, a number of vulnerable customers were initiated through EIC. Um, we improved that over the course of the EIC system. 
partly because of some of the cases that were brought to various hearings of the committee, so we could identify where in our exclusion process we were falling, falling um, where it was not working for us. So what we have right at the moment with the QP system, as well as the vulnerability indicator from the <coughs> participation arrangements and the range of other things that we'll take on notice, we're also screening the data in a 24-hour period. So, if a cust so the only ones that may be um, triggered now, initiated, is if the vulnerability indicator goes on 24 hours after we've initiated yes. it. So we haven't got the databases in full sync, and that was a significant problem we had in the EIC period, mm -hmm. um, was the, the lag in database identification and then right. movement to the initiation system was was a factor. So, sorry, if you, you just said if they go on after 24 hours or within the 24 hours? If the We're running the filter daily now yes. to make sure we can match up with people at vulnerabilities. So if they come in within that period, they might slip through. Correct. Okay. And the other change we did, Senator, during the EIC period when I've unpacked what's, what's gone on, uh, early EIC, we excluded people who had a current vulnerability indicator. So from some of the other evidence you've heard Vulnerability indicators go on, mm -hmm. they go off, mm -hmm. the customer then may present again. We made a change during the course of EIC to actually go back to a couple of, back to the beginning of 2017, and our rule was any indicator at any time back to the beginning of 2017, we would exclude them. Okay. So it's an improvement, and we are seeing that in the reduction. What date did you make that change? I call that the late EIC period. Senator, I'll take it on notice. It's like Jurassic. I was just it, thinking. It, it, is, <laughs> it has been a bit of an archaeological examination. When people um, come back and dig, they won't believe what they're going to find. So the debts that, in this answer to this question, question two of the 22nd of November, um, where I was asking around this issue, the number of people that have been referred to debt collectors, then at 1,812, are you able to break that down? Was that OCI, I, I, EIC? I, I'd have to take that um, on notice, Senator, but I will. And are they We can identify still... them and have a look at, um, and you're interested in their current status. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I'll take that on notice. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of, and I'll, I know Senator O'Neill's got um, some further questions here. In terms then of how that interacts with with partial capacity to work, would Mr. Bennett, I must say I'm still confused, then how the partial capacity to work process differs from the vulnerability indicators from DHS and the uh, job capacity assessment process? Effectively, Senator, the partial capacity to work, as we've discussed previously, deals with the person's capacity to work if it's less than, than 30 hours. Yeah. And that might be caused by a number of different factors. But it's done within that stream of working out the ability for the person to participate in activities um, that um, whether or not they're above or below 30. Yeah. So it's almost, and I'm not saying that some of these people won't be vulnerable, but it's almost like we've got two different lenses looking over them from two different sort of frameworks. And the vulnerability indicators that people would have, certainly some of the partial capacity to work would be, um, would be um, subject to vulnerability indicators. If it would be of assistance, I can take this on notice. Yes, it would be. Could okay. you take it on notice? To, but also then I should be asking how many people with a partial capacity to work have had a debt? Uh, initial letter and a debt notice. Can I suggest that you might want to refer that to my colleagues? Yes, I am. Okay. That's what I, that's that. Oh, sorry, I was shifting my gaze, but I'm just wondering: Does partial capacity work show up in the DHS? How it shows up in the DHS system? We'll have to take that on notice, Senator. Initially, to have a look at what's feasible or possible with the different data sets and the reference points, um, and then we can see where, what we can do. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to put some questions on notice, but I'm aware of the time and I'm aware that Sandra O'Neill has more questions in employment. Thank you. Um,
just if I can go quickly back to the changes that were announced by Minister Robert on November 19, um, was this informed by legal advice to the department? Is that a new question, Senator? Or is yeah, that I'm just going to go through my list. I want to make sure I've covered it off. Yes or I no? I'm sorry, could you ask the question again? So, with regard to the changes that were announced by Minister Robert on November 19, was this informed by legal advice to the department? So, all of the changes that we made to our process are informed by a range of things. They're informed by the work we do with our customers and our staff who know this process is very well, the work we do with third party organisations, non government that, organisations, uh, that's not ombudsman doctors. Question, if you can and just, they're also. Yes or no, because I've got five pages of them, Dr. Yep. Baxter. And, and clearly, any. Um, litigation that we may have on foot at the time is something that we take into account as we're reviewing those processes as well. Thank you. How is the introduction of proof points as supporting evidence not a reversal of the onus of proof? Um, so the minister's reference to further proof points in his um, initial statement of the change that was being referred refers to the fact that we will no longer solely rely on income averaging as the basis of generating a debt. So, for example, in reviews that we have in train at the moment, we're working with customers to see what other information they may have for us. Perhaps that's bank statements, pay slips, other information they might be able to provide. And in our work that we're doing that I outlined before about looking at the processes going forward, we're looking at what might be appropriate ways to take those next steps for that group as well. So he's so, referring to other information other than um, income average ATO data that we may be able to obtain in working with the customer. So that's two sources that I'm aware of, which is bank statements and former wage um, verification documents. Is there anything else? Um, it may be that there's a range of other information that the, that the customer has or we have on our record. I don't think that they're the only two. They're certainly two really important pieces that if we look to. If you could take on notice to provide me with the other sure. sources of proof that you use, I would appreciate that. And my question following on from that is, does this mean the department will now be redirecting resources to use its powers to obtain employment information under the Act, which in previous hearings you've indicated, <coughs> excuse me, has only occurred 1,000 times out of the 700,000 plus people who have had a robo debt served. So my recollection, Senator, is that 1,000 was in relation to employers, and I think you're asking about employers and financial institutions now. Um, our practice is currently that if people um, that, that our first step would be to speak to customers to see what information they have on hand. If they need extra support in obtaining that information from either financial institutions or employers, we can use our powers to help them obtain that. And, and, and my question is, are you going to use them in the way that you used to use them before the robo-debt scheme came in and this got cost shifted as a work of incredible tapestry by Australians right across this country, 700,000 of them? So, Senator, my understanding is there's been no change to our ability to use those powers or the circumstances in which we would use them. Given what's um, happened, is there a change in your will, Dr Baxter? So certainly for those cases that are on foot at the moment, we are using those powers where it's appropriate for us to do so, where okay. the customer indicates they're not able to provide information um, and it seems reasonable that we would use those powers to help the customer obtain some of that extra information. And how many In terms of those cases are there, Dr Baxter, where you are now using your powers where you previously did not? Um, so I wouldn't characterise it that we previously did not use those powers. I think my recollection of the amount of um, times when we've spoken to financial institutions, for example, to obtain extra information is something in the order of 20,000, but I'd, I'd have to um, include that in my answer on notice. Um, so I think it's incorrect to characterise that we haven't done that in the past. In terms of what are we doing now, I can tell you that yes, we are working with customers as appropriate, using those extra powers where that's something that we need to do in order to work with them on their review. So is the message to the Australian people, stop freaking out about trying to get all the paperwork in order. If the DHS is in contact with you, tell, them, tell DHS to get the paperwork together and prove the case. Well, Senator, our first step would always be to work with customers to see what they're able to tell us, either about their pattern of work or about material they may have on hand. I think for everyone that is um, the least intrusive pathway, both for them and, and for the work that we're doing with them. Well, I'm going to disagree um, with you, Dr required, Baxter, on that, because it's very intrusive, and that's what people have told us, that they had to develop a whole lot of skills and go back over seven years to provide documentation. 
and they found it very, very difficult. You know, I couldn't get the answer of how many people. I appreciate that you put 20,000 as the contacts with the banks. Out of 700,000 people, though, that, that, you know, and 1,000 that you've contacted former employees, so 21,000 out of 700,000, that is a massive transfer of responsibility to Australians I, to I, I would have provide to. their information. I think we've answered that question before, Senator, that the obligation on people who are receiving welfare in these cases are to, are to provide us with that information they did. today. They did. And then and they if got they a death notice. to do that, they still have an obligation. Time doesn't limit their obligation. Mr. Murrick, uh, Mr. McNamara, or Dr. Baxter, can we go back to the to this issue in terms of you've frozen using income averaging? We've we've frozen debt recovery. Debt recovery. For those income averaging, and we have ceased the practice of using income averaging as the sole basis yes. of determining a debt. Yes. Yes. So, how are you now going to do that? So I think I've outlined the process that we're currently undertaking for those reviews that are already in train, yeah. and that is that we work with customers to see what information they can provide to us. That might be in the form of um, bank statements, pay slips, other information they may have. If we need to do extra in order to finalise that review, if the person's having trouble, then we will use those extra powers to obtain additional information. Okay. So, so the bottom here. line, just, just a minute clarify this. The bottom line is people are still getting initiation letters, uh, initial letters based and on So there are no averaging. initiation letters happening at the moment because we are in that... Um, well, how, sorry, I feel like I'm in a, in, a, loop. in a matrix or something here. Yep. How are you... You say you're working with customers yes. to get the information, but so if they're not I, getting the initial letter based so there on income no, averaging... There are no new... Where are we getting it from? Sorry? So there yeah, are yeah, but yeah, can I, can but I that's you, for can Christmas. I explain? So there are no new initiation letters happening at the moment, yes, Senator. We've explained Christmas. to you that we're in the modified servicing period. There yeah. are no new initiations, but we have reviews that we are already working with people on that commenced before this change was announced, where we're working through reviews with people. In those cases, <laughs> where we have live reviews on foot, this is the process yes. we're using to work with people. We are no longer using averaging. In that same way, staff have been instructed that we will not use um, averaged income data as the basis of a debt, um, and so we are working with them to see what information they can tell us or what they might be able to provide us. If not, we will use those powers that we have to obtain additional information where we need to. So if so Australians don't want to spend, you know, hours, tens and tens of hours, backtracking for seven years, they should say to the department straight up, I haven't got that documentation. You have the powers to get it. Please get it. That's so what they should say to you. Our staff will be working with people on what they have and working with people on what we need to do to assist them to finalise the review. So they will be providing them with advice about the sort of support we can provide and also well, the information that if they have it would be useful for them to be providing to us. Well, the advice that they've been receiving is get your paperwork together by yourself and, and that is proved completely unsatisfactory. Um, can I just ask? Can I just before yeah. before we go on to the next one, what happens in February when you start again? When yes. you go out of the modified process? But, so but we, I, I think, Senator, it's important to note that debts that have been raised under the program, as we said previously, are not all involving income averaging. Mm. So, I if, understand. so if a debt was um, uh, finalised six months ago without income averaging, it can still be finalised today without income averaging. Yes, I understand. I'm yes. asking what happens when the new, when the process starts again in February, I appreciate what you've said, what I'm trying to find out is what the new process is going to be in terms of when you first initialise it, if you're not using income averaging and you're so, not sending the so initial So what I letter. have said, Senator, is that we are not using income averaging as a sole basis of determining a debt. In my opening statement, I advised you that ATO income data will still be used to identify where there is a substantial discrepancy. So if, if, if we were, we are not sending initiation letters at the moment, but if we were, um, that discrepancy letter could still be sent on the basis of saying, hey, we've received this ATO data, it doesn't seem to accord with what you've told us, can you please work with us on this process? 
As to what will happen in February, I've talked through with you that there are a number of processes underway in the department at the moment to look at options of what will happen for this group and for the program going no. forward. But the government is on the record saying that further information would be sought other than raising a debt solely on the basis okay, of income yeah. average so, data. Work with me here. Come the February, whenever the new process normality resumes, you've got ATO data, you've got what the customers said. You reckon they don't match, which is highly likely, as I've said many times, if I've been off income management, I've worked, etc. What happens then? You've got two bits of paper that don't match, but income averaging, if you had no normally under the previous process, they'd get an initiation letter. So if that process were to go forward in that same way, so if the process were to go, and, and as I said, we're working through what the processes will be going forward, but the government has not said that it will not use income averaging data to identify discrepancies. It has only said it will not use income average data as the sole basis for determining a so debt. So I still get an so initiation So it would still letter. be used to say, hey, there's a discrepancy here. What would then happen is that we would seek to work with people to understand what is the basis of that discrepancy. And in looking at all of that and in attempting to determine whether a debt exists, we would not use only the averaging of that data as the sole basis of determining a debt. We would need to either get more information from someone, additional information, perhaps or information they can... Or go and get that information yourself as or the go department. And get, or go people, and get need that to, people need to know that. Or go and get that information ourselves. But what I have also what said to, to you, but what I have also said to you <laughs> is that the process for this cohort that are in scope and also the process going forward are very much something we are still working I understand. I'm not, I'm not talking about the group that are already in, that have already been through the process. I'm talking about the new yeah, people yeah. when you're We're just about out of time yeah. and I have, haven't got through my question, so I want to see I've got extension. Mine, no. for, well, I can't really understand. Do you want to go? Can we extend to for 15 minutes? Yeah. Is that okay? People make 15 minutes. Thank you. I can stay for 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So can I just stay stay minutes. charge stay through minutes. these without any further? Are officers able to stay for 15 minutes? Thank you. Excuse me, Chair, too. I can also come back to you on a couple of the questions you asked around DPOs and withholdings if, if you want to do that. Yeah, Thank at you. the end, if you could tell yep. us that, that'd be good. Excellent. Um, we haven't got any numbers of the kind that we wanted earlier. There's no numbers emerged no. about the number of people. No. Hmm. Okay, the Minister's urged individuals with robo-debt to wait for the department to call them rather than contacting Centrelink. How many phone calls have been made to the department rega regarding robo-debt since the announcement on the 19th of November? <coughs> um, so, Senator, I'd have to take the exact number on notice, but I can tell you that there's not been an increase in the number of calls to our compliance line or generally to our customer service line. How much does each phone call typically cost the department in terms of taking up staff resources? Uh, I would have to take that on notice. Um, what's the diversion of the department's telephony services? Um, was this diversion of the department's telephony services the reason the minister urged people to stop calling Centrelink after the scheme was found unlawful by the federal, government, federal court? I'm sorry, which diversion of telephony services? Well, the minister I indicated told there people... has been no diversion of... There's been no change to our normal pattern of... of um, receiving telephone calls so since the... So, are you aware of the minister's statement? Yes. Telling people not to call Centrelink? Well, I think the minister's statement was that people should not feel that they have to call, that they will be contacted regardless, that um, we were concerned to make sure people did not feel that they had to do something to make sure that they were identified as a case that had used income averaging as the sole basis of their debt and that they didn't have to do something to make sure that recovery of their debts was frozen. So we were seeking to reassure people that you don't need to do anything, we will do both of those things. And as I've said to you, there has been no um, change in the, in the call volume. I, mean, so I don't have the exact numbers with not me, to call was effective. Um, what is Centrelink sta staff telling people who call um, and ask, are their debts being placed on hold? So whether people call through our normal DHS lines or through our dedicated compliance line, they'll be given the information that we've given you this morning, which is that we're working through a process of identifying those customers who are in scope for this change, that as they're being identified as being in scope, recovery of their debts will be frozen. 
and that we will be writing to them or corresponding with them to let them know um, what the next steps will be. So is there a varied response for individuals or is there a standard response? Um, given that at this stage the process that we're going through is the same for everyone, which is a process of identifying who is in scope, and as we said earlier, that includes whether you've had your debt paid off, whether you fall into all those different groups we've been discussing this morning, everybody would be getting the same information, which is we are working out if you are one of these customers whose debt has been subject to this type of averaging, and if we work out that you are, we will freeze recovery of your debt if you have a debt, we'll freeze recovery of your debt immediately, and we will write to you about what the next steps are. So there is no differentiation at this point in how we're treating those cohorts. We're identifying them and we're freezing their debt as we identify them. So on that basis, of course, they're all receiving the same information. Right. Are the debts immediately being referred to an authorised review officer or are they still being nudged towards an internal assessment? Which debts are you referring to, Senator? When people ring up about the debt that they have had generated against them. So uh, there was some evidence that people had requested um, an authorised review officer to look at their work, but to, to look at their case, but it had been taken instead as a referral to an internal assessment. Is that still the practice that's operating? So our standard practice is that anybody who seeks a formal review can receive a formal review. So would you be able to provide on notice the numbers of people who've sought a review? I believe we have provided that recently yeah. on, in a question on notice. I understand, Senator, we have provided um, the numbers of, of formal reviews for people in the program um, and also the, the numbers that have gone both to an authorised review officer and also to the AAT. But Mr Seaback may be able to help me out here. I think I, I, I'm oh, sure correct. I've read very recently that we've provided this. That's correct. So we've provided numbers in, and, and, and added to those numbers also the number, um, number of people um, who have gone through to subject matter experts because I think as most people appreciate as part of that formal review mechanism, the first point of call is to us people who ask me like, a, like my decision review, they go to a subject matter expert who checks the facts, makes sure quality assures the decision. The individual still disputes the decision. It then goes to a formal internal review by an authorised review officer. Again, if they are not satisfied with the outcome, they then go to the administrative appeals tribunal should they do so. And you're confident that people who request a review are being advanced to the authorised review officer, not just going through an internal assessment? Where it's, yes, where it's appropriate and that's what they want. They have a statutory right of review. Right. What if they don't really know the difference? We try and explain what the differences are. And indeed, some people actually don't want to be pushed through the formal review mechanism. They just want to have their um, initial, um, I guess, decision um, to be um, looked at again. Okay. And so, um, so do you advise people that um, if a debt goes through to an authorised authorised review officer, that uh, those debts are reduced on yeah. average by seventy five percent? Oh, I'd have to take that on ice. So I don't believe that to be the case. Well, I think that's from the Quan. In, in the context of all all debts or, yeah. or just... Yeah. I, no, I think that's... Uh, yes, so that when people not, ask for a review, their debt's actually reduced by 75%. So I think there's the a, a couple of... The reassessment process or...? Well, there's, no, we're not talking, I think we're talking about the review process thing. There's a couple of things here. One is that um, we know that less than 1% of these types of debts that we've been talking about this morning that are formally reviewed end up um, with a change to the review outcome. I assume you're talking about where there is a change, how much that change is by, and I don't think I, we, we would have that number to hand. But, where but there that is might, a so, sorry, Senator, you, you may be deriving that number from a process that occurs before yeah. the formal review, which we call a reassessment mm. process, which is where a customer will present on the phone and say, I'm unhappy with my death. The compliance officer will explain their formal review rights, but then we'll also explore with the customer, would you like to look at, this ag at the debt again, the calculation? Do you have any more information that you can give us to have a look at it? And often the case is a customer will then be able to present us with payslip, bank statement, calendar entry, verbal evidence, and then we will reassess it, and sometimes that debt will be reduced. Mm. Are we talking about the discrepancy notice in the first place? Is that where you started from? Um, I think that's what it sounded like, rather than the debt that's been determined. 
Debts that go through to ARO are reduced by 75% is what so I was that's that's our, So we will have to take that on notice. Process. We do know that debts that go through, that, that only a very small proportion of debts go through to formal review processes at all, and of those that do, less than 1% of them are changed on appeal. As to the quantum of that change, once they are changed, we'd need to take that one on notice. I'm not if sure where you, that figure is. If you could and from, give I'm us sorry. the sort of the lay of the land with regard to that. Um, you have indicated that you're going to be writing to customers to advise them of future changes to the scheme that will impact on them if there's any new legislation, but that, that letter is not yet formulated, is that correct? So I think I've mentioned, the letter that I mentioned this morning was the letter we're working up at the moment to make sure that as people's recovery is being frozen, we can write to them to say, um, we've identified that you're part of this group and we've frozen recovery so they understand why there's been a change potentially to what they're getting in their pay each fortnight. So I sort of flippantly before and said, you know, Dr Baxter, will it, will it say, we made a mistake? Because people who've been caught up in this actually deserve acknowledgement that there's been a mistake made by the government in their communication with them, rather than, you know, this was an iterative process problem. People expect the government to own this and say sorry. And as the government's agency, can you, can you uh, reassure me that it actually will say we're sorry? Well, as I've indicated, we're still working through exactly what's going into that letter and talking to customers about it. Um, what it will be focused on is saying there's been a change to the program and you are one of the people who's affected by this change and here's what it means for you. I am not someone who's very experienced. I certainly have members of my team here with me who are experienced in that process of working with customers. But they assure me that often the things that we think are helpful to add into letters don't necessarily aid the understandability of those letters and making sure they're as kind of clear and direct as possible for people about what this I means. I think people for understand what sorry means and what they need to do. Um, so that's what we'll be focused on. It's important to understand, Senator, as we can see from our submission, that any reassessment process has winners and losers. Yeah. That's, that's an important point. So you're sort of suggesting that a reassessment process may end up with less debt or, or no debt. Well, well given that is a, that the is High a possibility. Court, well, exactly, given the High Court's ruling but, about but the demand the for payment not being our, valid. Well, the data sitting in our submission suggests there's different, yeah. different possibilities here. Hmm. Um, go up. Could you provide an update on the financial implications of the scheme overall, including the total cost of the scheme uh, since commencement at November 19. I'm sorry. Could you I think I asked a question about cost centres yeah, around we did. remediation. You so what about is this new question? So I just want to be clear as I'm working my way through that you will provide on notice a breakdown of the costs. And no, I don't, I don't believe I took that on notice, Senator. I think what I said is that we are not able to know at this point, because we don't know the size of the impacted cohort, what, what the impacts might be, if any, on the program going forward. Um, I mentioned to you we work closely with social services and, um, and the Department of Finance on that. Um, I mean, it is worth noting, just to the point Mr McNamara just made, the historical data we provided in our submission about the outcomes of reassessments. I think it was in Appendix A, mm. pages 15 to 17, which showed that um, reassessments thanks. of overpayments do result in a number of outcomes. A very small number of overpayments under QP were reduced to zero. Some got reduced to an amount greater than zero, and in some, the overpayment increased. So we just don't know at this point what this change, what impact this change is likely to have. Could you take on, on the notice forward. the total amount recouped? Re recouped. The I, don't, I don't need to take that on notice. I can tell you. Do you mean recouped under the program to yeah. date? Um, since November 19. Oh. No, I would have to take that on notice. Money's increased or reduced by reassessment? So, so sorry, Senator, to be very clear. At the moment, we are still identifying those cases that are in scope for this change. So none of those, any changes that may result from next steps, none of those have happened yet. There are, all that's happening at the moment are in-flight reviews, so reviews which were but already- But there's also, there's freezing. There is freezing. Yeah, what's the amount of that? Okay, so you want to know on notice 
as at today's date, how much has been the frozen? quantum of what has been frozen? How many people and the amount? Thanks. Robo debt was being used by the government to achieve a $2.1 billion budget savings target. Um, and we know that from uh, cabinet documents that were uh, leaked, the government was $600 million behind in its target. It was considering a proposal to expand the program to the vulnerable and sensitive groups that Senator Seward asked about, uh, including homeless people who were homeless, over 65 people with disability. Is the government still considering this proposal? The government has no plans to change the prioritisation of groups at this point. So there won't be an expansion to, of that's the program? A, that's, a, that's a decision for government. And I've indicated that there, is a, there are a range of processes that have been looked at at the moment, but the government has no plans. Has the department done any work on the impact of the suspension of the scheme, as it was previously constructed, on the proposed savings that the government is targeting? How much so, less income are you expecting? So I think we've, we've sort of answered this in a range of these questions you've asked me about the forward budget, which is to say we don't know at the moment that it will be very much impacted by the size and shape of this cohort that we're identifying at the moment, that we're working closely with social services and finance to try and understand those impacts as we have a better shape of the group and as we understand more fully what the, the next steps are that will be applied to that group. So any of those questions that go to what is this going to go to cost going forward, what's it going to do to the forward savings, the forward costs, we simply won't know until we understand. But I have indicated to you that there are a range of outcomes that can come out of reassessments of debts should those debts be reassessed as part of this forward process. So at this stage, Services Australia and no other department, have you, any of the other departments, have you undertaken any, any modelling of the budget implications for the suspension? No. Our focus at the moment is on trying to identify the inputs that you would need for any such modelling. So to do any such modelling, you're going to need to understand the size and shape of this cohort and you need to go and understand what is the process, what are the next steps that you're going to take with this cohort. So and at the moment, we are still just working through both of those things. The, I'd like the total cost broken down in whatever way you could of the mopping up of this mess that's been going on. You have to wind up. So yeah. last I'm last sorry, last I don't, I, could you just clarify what that last question I'll is? I'll put that one on notice. Can um, details be provided of any ministerial briefing held in relation to the implications of robo-debt um, with regard to the Infosys contract? So, sorry, could you clarify this? So I just have lost you a bit with the question. The Infosys contract has been announced in recent days. Yes. Are, you, are you talking about the entitlement calculation engine yeah. contract? Is yes. that the one? Yes. Which is relevant for you? We, we would have to take that on notice, Senator. Does that system interact with DHS's system? I understand so it does. It's not a system that exists currently. It's a, a, a new system that's being envisaged that is being and built. And it's just been so announced? At the moment, it's not part of our compliance system at all. Um, I'd have to take on notice any implications, Senator. So if you could take on notice any implications of the robo-debt matter for the Infosys contract, um, single touch payroll, any legislative change or other changes of future operation of income. Um, last one, if I can. Um, with regard to the new structure um, with the changes in machinery of government, what are the reporting arrangements for Services Australia within DSS? Is it going to be similar to the NDIS? And um, how much involvement will Secretary Catherine Campbell have with income compliance and has she been briefed? on the recent updates. Is that to take on notice? Well, can you answer that briefly now? So the machinery of government changes that have been announced don't take place until 1 February. And my understanding is some of what that means and how that will look, the shape of the two departments is still being worked through. Um, it, what we do know is that it will be an executive agency within the DSS portfolio. And Ms Campbell, just to be clear, Ms Campbell was the secretary of the department when the first iteration of the robo-debt was designed, is that correct? Um, I don't have the exact dates with me, I'm sorry, okay. um, Senator. Can you Thank take you. that on notice? Certainly. Okay. Got a um, Mr. Seabitch, is it going to be quick or I'll should... I'll try and be as quick as I can. Okay. Just in relation to the number of DPOs in relation to social, um, social welfare debts issued since the legislation came into effect in 2017 to 30 September this year, 2019. 
Um, we've issued 138 departure prohibition orders to 114 people and the value of the debts covered by these prohibition orders is 3.2 million. Thank you. In relation to withholdings, um, the current con so the initial debt advice to current customers um, um, seeks repayment in full within 28 days. Let it also notes if you don't pay the, to recover the money owed, the department may, amongst other things, reduce payments you receive from us, so withholdings from existing social security payments. If a current customer contacts the department within the 28 days, they can negotiate a non-standard withholding rate. If they do not contact us, the department applies automatically the standard withholdings on a customer's social security, family or student assistance payments. The standard rate of withholdings differs based on whether the customer receives a social security payment, family or study assistance, but in the context of social security payments, the standard withholding rate is 15%. The rate of withholding is not legislated, it's a matter of government policy, and the last increase to the standard withholding rate for social security payments was in 2009-10 budget, where the rate increased from 14 to 15%. And finally, as at 30 June this year, 2019, 64% of current customers with withholdings had negotiated a non-current rate of recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. If we could get responses to the questions on notice by mid-January, um, that would be appreciated. Um, there are lots of questions on notice. Um, I still have lots. Uh, I'm sure Senator O'Neill does, and and I think um, Senator Askew and Senator Hughes may have some. I'm not sure. Um, thank you very much, and we'll get those to you as soon as possible. Uh, we will adjourn, um, and um, we'll see you all in the new year. Thank you. Merry thank Christmas you. and Merry Happy Christmas New Year. Everybody. Thank you very much.